It was just a regular school day, and I was sorting out my locker when suddenly I heard hushed whispers and noticed that everyone else was staring at something. Okay, so turns out it wasn't a something, but a someone. As this pretty girl strutted down the corridor like it was a runway or something. Ugh. Why was everyone gulping at her, rushing over to greet her, and sticking notepads in her face for her to sign? I hugged my books and muttered, Geez, there's nothing special about her. So, my name's Lily, and I'm just a normal girl. My family? Yeah, they're normal. My appearance? Normal. And my social status? Well, that's just normal too. I coast through life, and that's it. Nothing exciting ever happens to a regular girl like me. Oh, how I long to be the perfect looking girls on Instagram. They're so flawless in their clear skin, stylish clothes, and glossy hair. But those girls were different. They were from different worlds. Oh well, at least I still had my books, my bestie Sarah, and my cute boyfriend Brian. But this all changed when Stacy rocked up at school with her perfect looks and her I'm so sweet and friendly routine. Yeah, right. So what if she had a prettyish face and a bit part in some TV show underneath the fake shine she was clearly not all that? I walked into English class to see her sitting at the desk next to mine. Ugh, great. I couldn't even get to my seat because everyone else was surrounding her, asking her dumb questions such as, What shampoo do you use? And do you get snack breaks when you film your show? Jeez, give me a break instead. Then, when I finally managed to sit down, she smiled at me and in this sickly sweet voice said, Hi, I hope it's okay I sit here. I'm Stacy. Yeah, sure. I forced a smile back, but on the inside, my anger was boiling over. Who did this girl think she was? So what if she was beautiful? I bet she only cared about her looks and never bothered studying. Yeah, everyone else would soon realize what a failure she was. Then, one time during recess, Stacy, the living Barbie doll, suggested we start a yearbook and now everyone's treating her like she's achieved world peace or something. Ugh, you know the worst part of it? I've been saying we should start a yearbook for years, but no one listened to me. And guess who received so many welcome cards and love notes that they fell out of her locker and obstructed the hallway? Yup, Stacy. Gosh, it's been like weeks already. When will these stop? I hated how she thanked everyone and blushed and ugh. I needed to be around a sane person who didn't think the sun shone out of her. She was everywhere. It made me sick. But thank God for lunchtime. It became the only peaceful time of the day for me, when I could hang out with Sarah and not have to worry about Stacy. But ha! Huh, what was this? What was that Barbie doll doing sitting at our table and talking to my best friend? I walked over there and placed my tray down next to Sarah. Oh, hi Lily. Stacy just said the funniest thing. Great, I muttered under my breath. Lunch was an ordeal. Sarah ignored me and kept on asking Stacy dumb questions like, Is your co-star Kyle as handsome in real life? And how do you style printed skirts with a colored tee? Yawn! Later that day, due to a paint spillage in art, I was five minutes laid out. Sarah had agreed to drive me home, but I went out to the parking lot. Her car wasn't there. Then I checked my phone and saw that she'd messaged me. Where are you? I can't wait anymore. I'll leave first with Stacy. See you tomorrow, X. What? Is she ditching me to give that phony a ride? We had been friends since childhood. How could she be fooled for Stacy's act and just throw away our friendship like that? Angry, I messaged her back. You abandoned me for Little Miss Popular? How could you? I get it. New one in, old one out. Well, thanks a lot. My phone buzzed with her reply. Lily, you know it isn't like that. You live up the road from school while Stacy lives much further away and she needed to get back in time to get ready for her filming schedule. Madder than ever, I quickly typed out my reply. What? Ever. It's too bad you'll always be a nobody in her eyes, and she's just using you for a free ride. Then I chucked my phone onto my bed. I'd had enough. Sarah had made her choice, and it was to be friends with that fake over me. 
Sarah may have fallen into the Stacy trap, but at least I still had Brian, right? One afternoon, I was talking to him out in the schoolyard when Stacy tottered past. Even her try to hard walk was annoying. She smiled over my Brian. Then she deliberately tripped up and dropped the books she was holding. I grabbed Brian's arm to stop him from going over, but he shook himself free from my grip and went over to her anyway. I watched him help her pick her books up, and then she blushed and squeaked out a thank you. She was the worst. When he walked back over to me with this big grin on his face, I couldn't take it anymore. So I blurted out to him, How dare you leave me to help her? He gave me a confused look. Lily, I was just helping her out. Yeah, right. You knew she dropped them on purpose to get your attention. But you went over there to her anyway because you think she's prettier than me. He sighed. You're being ridiculous. You know what? I can't deal with your selfish, jealous streak anymore. Let's just call it a day. We're done. Then he walked off. I stood there watching him, expecting him to cool down and come back. Only he didn't. This was all Stacy's fault. She'd stolen my best friend and my boyfriend. No more. It was time to show her that she wasn't so perfect after all. I scrolled through her social media pages for ideas, and it soon became apparent that she loves boys with toned abs who ride motorbikes. How predictable. I discovered this website where I could hire a boy to play with her heart, then ditch her. It's about time she learned how much it sucked to be undesirable and worthless. Ha! I found the perfect guy called Josh. He was 19, a gym addict, and he had a motorbike. Whoa, he was expensive, but it would be worth it, right? I arranged to meet him at the local coffee shop, and jeez, he was even more handsome in person. I wished I could use this money to actually make him mine. Sigh. So, the deal is, he's gonna flirt with Stacy, make her love him deeply, and then break up with her. The next Monday, I walked out of school to see Josh parked up to the school gate, holding his helmet and looking like he belonged in a movie. Naturally, every girl was staring at him, but he made a beeline for Stacy. Then, just one week later, I saw him picking up Stacy from the school. Whoa, I knew that. I knew I had chosen the right person. Josh was such a lady killer. They looked super close and I had to remind myself that he was just an actor and he was doing his job. <laughs> she was going to be so heartbroken. But a few weeks later and he was still picking her up. Huh? Why hadn't he broken up with her yet? So I called him up and asked him what was taking him so long. He replied that he would do it soon. He was just making her fall for him more before he did it. <laughs> Brutal. Only the weeks passed by and he still hadn't ended it. Then I was walking past the movie theater and I spotted them there, kissing. What? This was not the plan! Furious, I had arranged to meet him the next day at the coffee shop. He walked over and couldn't even meet my eye as he said, I'm sorry, I can't do this anymore. I will refund you as soon as I can. Um, why? Have you fallen in love with her or something? I said jokingly. There was a long silence. Then he looked down at the table and muttered out, Yeah, I have. Why was I the only one on the planet who saw how thick she was? Thanks to her siren ways, I lost my best friend, my boyfriend, and now my savings. This was it. I needed to confront her. The next day at school, I tried finding her, but she was nowhere to be found. Then, as I passed through the school garden, I saw her sitting there. Gotcha. It's time to tell her exactly what I thought of her. I stormed over to her and opened my mouth to speak. But huh? Why was she crying? When she saw me, she managed to smile and said, Oh, hi, Lily. Is there a chance you could help me? I stared at her with disbelief. Did she think I was under her spell and would do her bidding? But then I saw what she was crying about. In her hands was her English essay with a big F on it. So I replied, Um, why me? You're so smart. You answer all the questions in class correctly. I don't want to be judged on my bad grades. That's why I left my last school. The other kids call me a brainless beauty. I moved here for a fresh start and now I'm still failing. Okay, so in that moment, I realized that there were things I was good at. My grades were good and I was pretty great at remembering facts. I'd just been so blinded by jealousy that I lost focus on these things and only saw what I didn't have. None of this was Stacy's fault. She'd never actually done anything bad to me. I'd made it all up in my head because I was jealous of her. So I sat down next to her and said, No one's going to call you that because I'll help you study. You will? 
She gave me a hopeful smile and I nodded. Thank you so much, she flung her arms around me. So that's how Stacy went from being my enemy to my friend. She's actually a really sweet and kind-hearted girl. No wonder why everyone admired her so much. And I was wrong to judge her on her appearance and not give her a fair chance. She's still with Josh and she doesn't know that I hired him to break her heart. But hey, she now has a hunky boyfriend who adores her, so that could be considered compensation, right? Brian and I are still over, but thinking about it, maybe this was for the best. I know I overreacted, but he gave me up so easily. And well, I want to find a guy who won't do that. As for Sarah, I went around to her house with a bag full of her favorite candy and I apologized for being a jealous jerk. Luckily for me, she forgave me. Now, Sarah, Stacy, and I have become good friends. Sarah and I both help Stacy with her studies and she gives us fashion tips. And you know what? I've come to realize that I'm pretty after all. I just needed to discover my spark. So finally, I learned that no one's perfect. Perfection is just an illusion. The most important thing is that we feel happy with what we own and never stop improving ourselves. So just be you and let everyone else concentrate on being them. Hi guys, it's me, Claire. So tomorrow is gonna be super exciting. I'm putting my life in your hands, literally, as I'm gonna be doing a My Instagram Followers Control My Day video. Yay! Most influencers do this with options, but I trust you guys, so go wild. Just visit my Instagram, like this video, and comment on whatever you want me to do tomorrow. The comments with the most likes will be chosen, and don't forget to follow me to stay updated. As you can see, I'm Claire, and I'm a beauty influencer on Instagram. Of course, with this pretty face and eye for style, I already have loads of followers. But for someone who was born to be famous like me, that's not enough. That's why I'm doing this viral challenge. It'll get me tens of thousands of likes. Okay, that's it for today. Now I better get my beauty sleep. Gotta have glowing skin tomorrow. The first thing to do in the morning was to check my Instagram. 20,000 likes from my post last night. That's average. Let's see. I asked my followers to decide what I should wear and what I should eat for breakfast. And the most liked comments were about Y2K style and avocado toast. My favorite dish anyway. Easy peasy. I called the maid to prepare breakfast while I did my skincare routine. Then I made sure I took a cute selfie and uploaded it to my story. What a good start. Am I the cutest girl on earth or what? Okay, now I have to make a very difficult decision. Which bag best complements my outfit? This one or this one? I was still trying to decide when my phone rang. Ugh, that's Liam, my boyfriend. It's so early, yet he's already sent me a ton of messages. What are you doing? Why didn't you reply to any of my texts? Hurry up if you don't want to be late for school. All right, all right, I'm coming. Jeez, why does he have to be so stressy? It doesn't matter if we're a little late. I mean, come on, it's only school. After choosing the right bag, I got into Liam's car. He frowned at me and asked me what took so long. I was busy taking selfies. I replied and posted a mirror selfie I took earlier on my Instagram with the caption, Y2K style for today. What should I do at school this morning? At break time, I was sitting in the cafeteria with Liam and my bestie, Tori. As usual, my beauty was attracting attention. All eyes were on me, and one guy even gushed out, You're so pretty, Claire. <laughs> I checked my Instagram to see how my newly posted pic was doing. Oh, it already had 50,000 likes. That's good, but I know with my charisma, I can do even better. But, huh? What's this? The most liked comment on the post wants me to go to the school library and scream, I hate studying and the library is the most boring place on earth. What kind of request is this? Don't do it. I don't have a good feeling about this. It could be from someone who's trying to sabotage you. Liam has a point. This could just be a trick that Isabella, my rival at school, devised to embarrass me. She's also an influencer on Instagram, 
but she just copies everything I do. Her Instagram is 5,000 followers less than mine. Yawn! But Claire, how are you going to explain to your followers if you bail out? I don't think they'd be happy about it. Hmm, right. I'm doing a challenge, aren't I? Can't stop after only two comments, especially because one from anti-fan. Besides, this is no big deal, right? Who even goes to the library anymore? So, I dragged Liam and Tori to the library. As you know, I need them to film me. Huh? Why was it so ridiculously busy in here? Since when did people actually want to study? I needed to get this over with. So breaking through the silence, I shouted, I hate studying, and the library is the most boring place on earth. All eyes instantly fell on me, and I heard tuts and grunts. Then someone said, What the hell are you doing? Ugh. Why is everyone in here so serious? I just shrugged and walked away. At least Liam and Tori had captured me at my best angle. To my surprise, that video gained me a load of views and likes, and I even earned nearly 1,000 more followers. Who would have thought that such a silly act would get so popular? At that moment, Isabella walked past me. Only brainless people would scream in the library. Huh, look who's jealous now. Hey, you might as well try that. Maybe you'll get half of my followers. Isabella looks like she's about to explode with anger. <laughs> but then she sneered and said, Let's see if you're still laughing after you see what you've got to do next. Huh? What is she on about? I immediately opened my Insta to check. What? The top comment this time was from Isabella. She wants me to put a trash bag on my head and go to the mall. Ew, trash bag? I spent an hour styling my hair this morning. Isabella, you wicked witch. But okay, if she wants to play, I'll prove to her that she's messing with the wrong person. Just like last time, Liam tried to talk me out of it. This is nonsense, Claire. Don't lower yourself to this level just for a few likes. I told him he was overreacting, and that I wasn't going to let my followers down by bottling out of it. This seemed to annoy him, and he stormed off. Um, so who's going to take videos for me? I called out, but Liam just kept walking. Why can't he just support me like usual? Luckily, I still had Tori, and she agreed to film it for me. That's what best friends are for. Okay, this is more embarrassing than I thought. People keep staring at me like I'm an alien. I gave them a, what are you looking at, stare prompting them to quickly turn away. No, I have to act confidently for the video to get more likes. Looking over, I saw Tori cheering me on, so I took a deep breath, stood up straight, and did my best catwalk strut through the mall. My heart was pounding like crazy, even after we walked out of the mall. Phew, it was finally over. I then quickly opened up my Insta, uploaded the video I just shot, then texted Liam asking where he was. After that, Tori and I got in a taxi to his house. Liam was already waiting for me at the door, looking all serious when I got there. So I told Tori to wait in the taxi. Then angrily I shouted as I walked over to him, You could have at least come and supported me. Do you know how upset I was when you just left like that? I wasn't comfortable filming you make a fool of yourself. I care about you too much. It's just a bit of harmless fun. Why can't you understand how important being an influencer is to me? <sighs> I don't think I can be with someone who doesn't support me and my passion anymore. We should break up. Then I just walked away, not giving Liam a chance to explain. He quickly ran over and grabbed my hand. Okay, I'm sorry. Can we talk it out? <laughs> it worked! I gestured to Tori. Then turned around with a big smile at Liam. Can you believe the followers want me to test your love by pretending to break up with you? I'll show them how much you love me. But then, unexpectedly, Liam angrily shouted, What? So, I'm just another tool to get likes for your Instagram? If you want to break up, then fine. We're done. Then he stormed into his house and slammed the door. 
I stood there open-mouthed. How could he break up with me? In the whole two years we've been together, I've never seen him this mad. I'll let him chill for a bit and talk to him tomorrow. He'll have calmed down by then. Right? Look, Claire! Your shopping mall video has already reached a hundred thousand likes! Oh my god, what is this? People are going crazy for my videos. They say I'm so confident, wearing a trash bag and still looking stylish. I look like Kendall Jenner. And my followers also increased by 5,000 people. At least this is worth the effort I put in. The next morning, I waited for Liam to pick me up. But he never arrived. When I got to school, I tracked him down and asked if he was still mad at me. You're so addicted to social media. I don't even know who you are anymore. Then he walked off. At that exact moment, Isabella walked towards me. Wait, why is Tori with her? Hey, loser. You're in so much trouble. What does that mean? I looked at Tori in confusion, but she just lowered her head and quickly followed Isabella. Feeling something was wrong, I immediately opened Instagram and... Oh my god. What are these comments? Such an attention seeker. She's willing to do anything just for some likes. I heard that her boyfriend broke up with her. No surprises there. <laughs> what is this? I did all these things at their requests, and now I'm the one receiving all the hate? Suddenly, the principal announced via the loudspeaker that I had to go to his office. As I walked in, I saw my parents sitting there. Turns out news of what I did at the library had spread. But not only that, someone even accused me of stealing from the shopping mall. Huh? I didn't steal anything. To prove my innocence, I gave the principal my bag to check. And he pulled out a brand new necklace. Why is this thing in my bag? I tried explaining myself, but no one would listen. I was suspended for a week. The walk out of the principal's office was the worst thing ever. Everyone was giving me judging looks and whispering to each other. On the way home, I took a teary selfie and posted it on Instagram with the caption, Consequences of yesterday's challenge. One week suspension. Someone put the blame on me. Once home, my ashamed-looking parents immediately took my phone away and even disconnected the Wi-Fi. Ugh! My life was over. I ran up to my room in a huff and flopped down onto my bed. Suddenly, my eyes crossed a photo I took with Liam on my birthday last year. That's when Liam threw me a surprise party, and he even made me a cute birthday cake. Come to think of it, I was a bit too harsh with him yesterday. He was only trying to protect me. If I'd listened to him, I wouldn't have all these hate comments and be stuck home for a week. I hurt Liam just to gain more followers. How could I be so stupid? I wished I could apologize to him right now, but... <sighs> then to my surprise, after just three days, my mom told me I was allowed back to school. There were still mutters about me, but that didn't matter as Liam was waiting for me at my locker. I hurried over to him, apologized, and explained everything. Claire, I know you're the sweetest, most loving girl. You just got carried away with your frivolous Instagram popularity. Besides, I know you're not a thief. Then Liam told me that out of suspicion, he asked to check different CCTV at the shopping mall, and discovered that it was Tori who dropped the necklace box into my bag. Turns out, she was only hanging out with me because I was famous and rich. So when Isabella paid her, she turned 180 degrees, running after Isabella and playing tricks on me. Liam reported this to the principal, and now both of them have been suspended. That's it. Chasing after popularity on the internet didn't bring me any real friends, but only virtual fans. And a fake friend, sadly. I got blindsided by the likes and followers and overlooked what was truly important. My real-life relationships and the people who genuinely care for me. After that incident, 
I decided to deactivate my Instagram account for a while, at least until I feel stable again. And even if I lose all my followers, I don't really mind anymore. Because right now, I'm spending time with those who really matter to me. It's the country's fair day today, or as I like to call it, my winning day. See that huge plushie over there? It's about to become mine. Ready, set, and yes, bullseye! I excitedly took the bear when it suddenly got yanked away by this crazy bull. Hey, I won that bear fair and square, but I saw it first. Now hand it over, hobbit. Hobbit? I yanked the bear from him, but it ended up ripping in half. His girlfriend burst into tears, and now I'm like a red rag to him. He rushed towards me, and before I could even think straight, my fist took over. How many times have I told you, Angie? A girl doesn't just raise her fist and cause trouble like that. It was self-defense. He was gonna hit me, Mom. I'm done with this. Like father, like daughter. Why are you even bringing him up? He left us years ago, so let him stay out of our lives. Even thinking about him made my blood boil. I turned to the window, avoiding the look I knew my mom was giving me. When we got home, we found the door open. Something wasn't right. I quickly ran into the house and saw black shadows standing in our living room. Who are you people? What are you doing in my house? All hail our new leader! The lights suddenly came back on, and I saw them all bow to... me? Angelina, I've been looking forward to meeting you. I'm Nick Mason, Mr. Bruno's right-hand man. My dad sent you here? From this day on, you will become our new leader of the X organization on his behalf. You gotta be kidding me! For so many years, he hasn't cared about whether we live or die, and now he suddenly wants me to take over? And look at you all. This organization seems no good. Please don't misunderstand us. X organization was founded by your father to help the local people and fight for justice. But things took a horrible turn, so I'm afraid he's gone to jail for a little while. He's in jail? Oh, my head! Fighting for justice? That's why he's in jail now? Your father put the safety of the seaport local first. In doing so, he fell into the enemy's trap. You will understand him better if you accept his wish and become our leader. As much as I hate to admit it, I missed my dad. He once promised that he would skip his work and hang out with me on my birthday, but then he just disappeared without a word and has been quiet for the past six years. Until now. Darling, I have something for you. She gave me some old letters and a plushie bear, which I'd begged my dad to buy for me. She'd hid it from me the whole time, as she was mad at my dad for always risking his life for things that weren't any of his business. It turned out that my dad had still cared about me, even without me knowing. Mom, I've made up my mind. I hope you'll support me. So, my mom and I had a long journey to the seaport of the city where my dad's ex-organization was secretly operating. We walked into the market, then stopped at a large fish shop. How on earth does an organization have their secret base in such a crowded place? The most dangerous place is the safest one. Remember that. I remembered my dad used to say this to me when I was a kid too. This must be his crazy idea. Nick led me into a room at the back of the store and introduced this as the organization's base. So this is where my dad used to work, and he'd still kept the same old hat all these years? Let's get to work. There's been a lot of theft going on in town lately. Every night, the thieves break into stores and steal everything they can. People are panicking right now, so we need to solve this as soon as possible. Isn't this the police's responsibility? If they were capable, we wouldn't have to get involved. That's why your father maintains this organization. Now you need to settle in a bit. I've arranged your accommodation and enrolled you in a local school. Remember, your identity is top secret. For the next few days, at 5 a.m. every morning, Uncle Nick got me up and took me to the port to tell me more about the thieves. However, he just joined the fish auction the whole morning instead of actually doing anything serious. So, I went somewhere else and pretended to talk to the fishmongers about the burglaries in town. At that moment, a guy in a cap that covered his face bumped into me. Hey, dude, nice bracelet, but ever taught to apologize? Hey, hey, take it easy. You're making a scene. Okay? Maybe I should just behave like a normal schoolgirl here. Having to get up so early in the morning to go to the port also made me too exhausted to study anything. One morning I was falling asleep at my usual place when some noise woke me up. A group of gangsters was teasing a boy? Dude, I'm trying to catch some shut-eye over here. Shut up, loser. Uh-oh, 
They were messing with the wrong person. I grabbed a nearby mop and made some fancy moves that took them all down, then dragged the flabbergasted nerd out of there. He wasn't calm enough to run for his life. This little guy is Killian. Ever since that day, he kept following me and wouldn't shut up about how strong I was, saying things like, I could never imagine a small person like you having such crazy strength. Or, they all pick on me, but you, Angel, don't. Then, let's be friends. I have no peace when he's around. While I was trying to make some space for myself, a call suddenly came from Uncle Nick. One of the jewelry shops in the city just got burglarized. Can you help? What? Yeah, I'll head back to headquarters and set up a plan. You can count on me. I then hung up, and that's when I heard a ball hitting the floor. I turned around, and there was Killian, standing behind me, shocked to the core. He'd obviously heard the whole conversation. If you utter a word of this to anyone, you'll not wake to see another day. Do you hear me? I… I can help you! I know this town like the back of my hand! Okay, we can be friends. Or associates. As long as you keep quiet. After school, Killian and I rushed to the crime scene. While wandering around, I spotted a shiny thing among the broken glass. It must have been from those thieves. But wait, I've seen this D symbol somewhere. I was about to pick it up when Killian grabbed my hand, shivering. Bro, it's her who attacked us back then. That gangster suddenly came at me. I tried to dodge him, but ended up toppling over backwards. Suddenly, a strong arm held me back and shielded me from the punch. Mamma mia! Who's this handsome hunk? I wrapped my arms around him and pulled out my inner damsel in distress. Oh, my hero! These jerks won't leave me alone! Please save me! I'm scared! Mess with my friend one more time and you're dead meat. Get lost! He turned to me, making sure I was okay, then parted way. Through Killian, I found out his name is Frank a senior at our school, and he's known for his cold and reserved demeanor. Definitely my type of guy. But wait, what about the bracelet? I returned to the broken glass window, the bracelet was nowhere to be found. At school, all students were constantly talking about these recent burglaries. Everyone was worried about who would be the next victim. When will all this nonsense stop? I wonder who their next target will be. Don't you see? The recent victims were all the big shots in town, and the crimes were all on the days the police weren't out patrolling. So then, Graham's jewelry shop and Holden's boutique store could potentially be their next target? That makes sense! Uh, wait, Frank? Now that you're here, I feel so much safer. It'll probably be Holden's because Graham already added a new security system to his shop. Please stop fiddling with your hair like that. Good observation. The police don't patrol the port tonight, so they might make a move. So stay still inside, will you, sweetie? Aww. But his sweetie still gotta watch Holden's shop and catch the thieves red-handed tonight. An hour had already passed, but nothing had happened. Right at that moment, Nick received a phone call that Graham's shop had just been robbed. The thieves broke the security system and everything had been taken. Nick snapped at me for acting impulsively without having any clear evidence. But this felt so sketchy, though. Holden's store was way more vulnerable. It's like they knew we were waiting to ambush them here. A few days later, while I was patrolling around the shopping street, Killian informed me that there was a suspicious masked man sneaking around the pearl shop. I immediately dashed there, right at the moment he was breaking the lock. In the blink of an eye, I kicked him, knocking him to the ground. Angelina! Holy crickets, are you okay? I looked up to see Frank running towards me. The thief immediately rose up, causing me to fall back, then fled the scene right away. Catch the thief, quick! Frank and Killian darted past me and followed the guy. I waited for them at the harbor, but only Killian came back. Oh, sorry, Angelina, but I have to say this. There's something fishy about Frank. I think he's on the thief's side. Oh, come on. Are you jealous of him? How do I know you're not their spy? What do you mean? You've been acting suspicious from the get-go. You wouldn't leave me alone for a sec. And remember how you listened in on my conversation with Nick? And what about when you made me so sure it was Holden Shop that would be the next target, hmm? And now you're blaming Frank? You're so wrapped up in that jerk. I saw him purposefully let that thief go. When I was about to catch up to him, Frank suddenly stopped, making me crash into him. Then the thief got away. That, that can't be. He's always there to help me. I'm the one who's always backing you up, but you only see that fraud as your hero. Ugh, just forget it. Wait, I, I had no idea who to trust. It was all so confusing. 
Right at that moment, I got a message from Frank asking me to go to this meteor camping place, as he had something important to say to me. Okay, it was time to confront him and get the truth. I rushed there as fast as I could, only to find… nobody? I looked around and noticed this suspiciously lit up tent. The tent flap suddenly opened, and a shadow bolted towards me. Hey, hey, calm down, it's me. I opened my eyes to see Frank in front of me. He'd set up this whole place for me? Frank suddenly took my hand and confessed. Angelina, I've fallen head over heels for you. I was wondering, will you be my girlfriend? Together, we could be a power couple. With your ex-organization and my Darkwalkers clan backing us, how do you know I'm related to ex-organization? Huh, <laughs> I've been watching you since that first day you wandered around the fish market with that old Nick. <laughs> Remember this bracelet? You almost got me that time. You, you shameless, rotten, stinking skunk! I even trusted you over Killian! Oh, come on. It's not my fault you fell for me and betrayed your best friend. You and I are more alike than you think. It's only fitting that we become a team. Enough! Listen carefully. I'm never going to team up with a dirtbag like you! H how did you- Guys, take her! From the tents, Frank's minions came out one by one and surrounded me, then gradually tightened the siege. Let's see who's the boss now. Oh, no, 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 I fell into his trap! Those punks held a rope, ready to tie me up, but right at that moment, I heard a car engine approaching. Is that Killian leading Nick and the X organization? He jumped out of the car, ran past the minions and Frank to get to me. Angelina, are you alright? You're not hurt anywhere, are you? I shook my head and felt so touched. He'd come to save me. I thought you were mad at me. I was, a little bit, but I couldn't let you do all this alone, so I went to Uncle Nick. Behind Killian, Uncle Nick and the team had seized all the thieves and their ringleader Frank. Now they'd spill all their dirty secrets in front of the law. It turns out, my dad was about to expose the Darkwalker clan for their evil antics when they framed him for intentionally causing injury and put him behind bars. Since I became the new leader of X, Frank had been trying to seduce me so he could manipulate the organization. Finally, though, my dad was found innocent and released. Mom and I welcomed him home with open arms. I'm so sorry for leaving you behind. I was afraid I would put you in danger. It's alright, Dad. You must have had a hard time, too. I'm sorry for taking so long to realize how proud I am of you. I missed you so much. Dad was super impressed with what we had accomplished for the organization. He even decided to let me continue to be the leader, all the while supporting me and teaching me his tricks. And I know for sure, everything will turn out okay, especially with this guy by my side. So, did I do a good job proving myself, lady boss? The vice leader position seems to suit me well, don't you think? Hmm, you do deserve a promotion. How does vice leader and boyfriend sound? Augustine and I almost took down this fake Roblox plushie smuggling empire when the gang leader suddenly turned vigilant and ordered his members to arm lock us. Pablo, you got it all wrong. We're here to make a business deal. You don't fool me, you sneaky little rats. Think you can catch me? I am invincible! <laughs> suddenly, there was a knock on the door. Pizza's here. Please take your order. Did any of you morons order pizza? Sorry, boss. I, I did. I was starving. Please could I have a bite quickly before executing these snakes? Go get the door, you dumbo. You, hands over your head. Pablo then came, hide behind the door as it opened and standing there was Jane. Hi, lunchtime. Jane then pulled up her skirt slowly, revealing her stocking. While the gang were dumbfounded, Augustine quickly restrained the gang member, while Jane slammed the door onto Pablo. And me? I stomped onto the guy's foot, elbowed him in the face, and pinned him on the ground. Phew, all hail Queen Jane. Hi, my name is Naomi, a special agent, and these are my partners, Augustine and Jane. With Augustine as leader, we three have successfully cracked the hardest cases, including this one. Augustine is such a respectable senior agent to me, while Jane is actually my annoying stepsister slash partner. It's your turn to write Pablo's case report. Don't push it onto me. Why do you always try to get away with tasks? Just like how you made me do all the dishes at home all the time, too. Team, we got a new case. Amy, straight A student. 
Lawrence High's representative to the upcoming United Nations event, missing since Monday. Urgent request from parents and the school to bring the subject back safely. Suspect number one, Shirley, direct competitor for the school representative title, a mean girl in disguise. So, starting tomorrow, we'll be students at Lauren High to investigate it. Can I join the girl posse and befriend Shirley? Nothing helps spilling the tea easier than blending in with the gossip girls. Okay, but we also got Diane, Amy's stepsister, quiet and shy. Parents are freaking out and asking her to be watched 24 7 too. Jane, what do you think? I can approach Diane and keep an eye on her. Great. Remember, team, do not act by yourself under any circumstance. Lawrence High, I'm coming for you. On the first day of school with my excellent disguise, I confidently strode to the classroom. My mean girl covers quickly got everyone's attention, including this guy. Hey, cutie. Let me show you around, and you can show me the way to your heart. Marco, Lawrence High's jock with a notoriously long list of ex-girlfriends. Meanwhile, Augustine's also taking a good chunk of the ladies' hearts, including Shirley's, my target. So, I purposely walked past her, showcasing my $200,000 Hermes bag, and... Hey, you! Yes, take the bait, fishies. You seem to have a sensible fashion style. Wanna join our group? Sure, I'm Naomi. Right then, Jane passed by. In the shy, nerdy girl covers, of course. Hold on for a second, rookie. Did you borrow your granny's dress for school? Right, Naomi? I... I think... Oh, this hurts my eyes too. Who in God's name wears pastel pink in 2023? Shirley and her entourage were cackling while Jane gave me a hostile look and stormed off. Oh, please. She didn't have to take it so personally. She should thank me for that instead, as now she can naturally be friends with Diane too. Since then, I started hanging around with Shirley and the girls. They loved gossiping, which is indeed pointless until the topic of Amy came up. Have guys seen Amy around at all recently? Amy, who on earth? Amy Hayward, the one competing against you for the school's representative. Oh, that stupid contest. I couldn't care less about it actually. Thank God it's over. I only joined it because my dad kept insisting. Shirley didn't even remember Amy, nor did she want to compete with her. And now that I've noticed, she's boisterous at times, but actually quite straightforward. My guts are telling me it's not her. So, I brought up my concerns about the case at our next meeting. I'm pretty sure Shirley is clear. What? Do you even think before saying? She's her number one suspect. Plus, from what Diane told me, she's always picking on other students. Yeah, but that doesn't mean she has ill intentions towards Amy. You need to stop judging people too quickly. <laughs> Excuse me? How about you stop siding with the devils? Or you find it hard because you're one too? Enough. Let's just keep your assumptions on hold for now. We need more clues before acting on anything. Dang it. If only I got some solid evidence. Jane just always slowed down the investigation. So the next day, I went to find Diane myself to ask some more questions about Amy. But Marco stopped me with a bunch of roses? Roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you. Be my girl, will you? I was still processing this when Augustine came from afar and went straight into the roses. Oops, sorry, I had my sunglasses on. Marco looked like an erupting volcano while Shirley gave an earth-shaking squeal. Eee! Oh, that body and that grace. Oh, great lord, please spare me. During independent reading, Marco and his army came marching toward Augustine to pick a fight. But Augustine completely ignored Marco, which infuriated him even more. Hey, you! Turn your coconut head around and have some courage to face me. Augustine calmly stood up returned his book as if Marco was invisible, and came to ask me to have lunch with him? He pulled me out of there, leaving Marco behind, grunting like a mad pig. It feels good living student life and having the boys chasing after you. Stay away from those teenage boys from me, will you? I don't see why. Don't get your identity revealed. Don't worry, and Marco's such a kid, not my type. By the way, you want to experience a heartfelt infatuation too? Think Shirley is laying an eye on you. The look on his face is priceless. <laughs> Who would have thought this charismatic Asian is actually allergic to girls? During PE, I saw Shirley purposefully tripped and fell in the direction of Augustine, but ended up on the floor instead. Augustine then dashed over to me for help when Marco stopped him midway. Still holding grudges with Augustine, Marco announced a dodgeball war. Oh boy, didn't know what he got himself into. Augustine is our top agent. 
He dodged every single bullet aimed at him, let alone these plain red balls. In return, Augustine gave Marco one hit of a lifetime that knocked him down on the ground. Lucky for him, Diane was nearby and kind enough to give him a hand. Still, Marco gave the biggest grin when he spotted me and headed over to hand me a piece of paper. Will you go out with me? What a loser. He must have taken a new interest in you, Naomi. Rumor had it he asked Amy out, but then she went missing. Probably that poor girl couldn't handle him. <laughs> Marco met up with Amy before she went missing? Uh-oh, he's our number one suspect now, not Shirley. I eagerly updated Augustine on Marco. I have a feeling Marco knows something about the case that might lead us to Amy. I was thinking I could pretend to go on a date with him. That's too dangerous. What if he's behind it all? You might get into trouble, Naomi. No worries, he seems really into me. He asked Amy out and she went missing right after. Who knows what could happen to you? But he's the only lead we have now. Shirley is already out of the picture and I know how to protect myself if anything happens. Please? And yes! The time has come for me to end this case. During the date, Marco was so caring, but I was dying to know what happened to Amy that day. So, I heard you and Amy were a thing before? Nah, we never got together. How can you be so perfect? Are you an angel? I heard otherwise. Rumors had it you even went out with her. Let's just focus on us, why don't you? But I want to know more about you too. Fine, fine. If you want to know it that bad, I did ask her out, but I never saw her that day. Her sister showed up instead, sat there at a reserved table, and said something about Amy wouldn't be around for a while. I thought they wanted to mess with me, so I just left. Diane knew Amy would disappear even before she went missing? Did Diane have anything to do with this? She might have been the very piece we'd overlooked from the beginning. I got to the office and saw Augustine fidgeting around. Are you okay? Did Marco do anything to you? I'm fine, and I got the biggest news. I then told Augustine and Jane everything and posed my doubts for Diane. Why Diane? She's just a vulnerable victim who gets picked on all the time. And you know by who? Shirley! She might appear vulnerable, but who knows what she's got inside. And you remember how she came to help Marco up that time? Now that I think about it, she was so worried for him. She obviously likes Marco. It's possible she might get jealous of her sister. Oh stop, not everyone is a jello like you. What? Team, this is getting nowhere. For now, let's just agree on keeping Diane close. Again, no one is to act by themselves. A jello? Just watch me nail this case before you do, Jane. The next morning, I saw Diane secretly watching Marco play basketball. I swear to God, Diane is definitely into him and involved in her sister's missing. But Augustine wouldn't let me do anything. That'd leave me with the only option, which is to keep Diane's activities on watch. Indeed, she's been acting very strange lately. She received regular phone calls and would get out of class, just to return with a troubled face. I decided to tail her that afternoon. She looked very suspicious and kept turning around to check if anyone was following her. She's definitely hiding something. We were walking for quite some time, passing a vast area of abandoned field crops, until she stopped in front of a shabby house. This is clearly not a building for residency. The whole place looked so torn apart and even had traps everywhere. Thank God I had all that training back in the academy to spot these deadly traps. Suddenly, I saw a flashing shadow sprinting right across the room. I quickly followed and saw a door leading to the dark basement. Diane, or whoever was staying here, is not going to be simple to deal with. Oh no, it's a trap! If you dare move an inch, you're done. Now tell me, who are you? Are you from the Dixie Mafia trying to get back at me? Mafia? N no, you got it wrong. I, I came to check on the electricity for this building. Please calm down. She's lying again, Mr. Gordon. I knew she was up to no good. Speak now if you want to stay intact. Oh no, no, no. I should have listened to Augustine and not let my stupid adrenaline take over. Is this the end of my mission? The end of my life? Suddenly, there was a loud banging sound. FBI, don't you dare touch her. It's Augustine. FBI, what? No, no, what's happening? Are you not from the gang? Jane was there for me too. She quickly took the bomb remote and turned it off. Fake bomb, are you kidding? I quickly got out of the trap safely. Special Agent Naomi Cooper, where are you hiding Amy? No, no, you got it all wrong. Mr. Gordon's Amy's biological father. How can he hurt her? I looked at Augustine and Jane, who were as shocked as I was. Mr. Gordon used to work for the gang, but he turned his life around. That's why he thought you were the old gang coming at him for revenge. 
Not long ago, he contracted a serious illness that needs a kidney transplant, and Amy is the only relative he's got left. You're telling me Amy agreed to give him a kidney? Then why are you here in the dark? Why hide? Because Amy's mom hated me and forbade me from seeing her, let alone giving me a whole kidney. But Amy is my daughter with a golden heart, even though I didn't want to. She insisted on giving me a kidney so I could live on. If mom knew about it, she would never agree. That's why Amy had to run away to have the transplant done with Mr. Gordon. Where is she now? Resting in that room. Don't worry, Mr. Gordon has been taking well care of her. Meanwhile, I helped bring them food and necessities. I quickly kicked the door open and saw Amy lying on the bed. What was all the commotion, Diane? Did you bring dad some squash? Augustine Jane and I saw it through now. We all got it wrong this whole time. The next day, we went to find Amy's mother and had a talk with her. She was shocked at first, but after knowing everything, she realized how wrong it was to separate father and daughter. She was so touched by her daughter's precious heart and agreed to let Amy come visit Mr. Gordon from now on. Looking at the sisters makes me think about my own sis. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. We gave each other a tight hug. We are sisters too in the end. Well, case closed. Let's go for some grand celebration, shall we? Actually, I have a date now. Why don't you take Naomi with you? Then she just left us there, cheeky Jane. I'm so relieved you're okay, Naomi. Because if anything happens to you... Yeah, Augustine? If anything happens, I would die for you. Hey, I'm Kirsty, and I have an identical twin sister called Arabelle. We didn't have a normal upbringing, as our mom abandoned us at an orphanage when we were six. We have our mom's dark blue eyes. That's pretty much all I remember about her. I'm not fully sure why she gave us up. I guess she was young and just couldn't cope. As little kids, my sister and I were close. We used to fool the other kids and the nuns into thinking that we were each other. Arabelle always wore a pink bow in her hair, so we'd both wear one and freak the kids out by double-crossing them in the corridors. Those were good times. But when we got older, everything has changed. I started to become green with envy at Arabelle. Everyone always liked her more than me. The nuns called her Little Cat, and every kid kept surrounding her like she was a sparkling star or something. They all thought she was so sweet and polite. This annoyed me because I knew the real her, and she wasn't sweet at all, if not a completely fake girl, and she just knew exactly what to say and do to get the most from people. Then, when we were 12, a lot had been happening that completely changed our lives. The orphanage had financial problems that could not be saved. Our nuns loved us so much that they didn't want to lose any of us, but they had no choice but to allow the social organization to find us adoptive parents. The nuns didn't want my sister and I to be apart, so they sent us to two families in the same town. But the god of justice must be blind as usual. Arabelle was way luckier than me. She was adopted by a wealthier family. My parents loved me anyway, but, well, she received all the best things, and that was just not fair. We went to the same school and I was so sick of listening to her bragging. When we were at the orphanage, we used to wear the same kind of clothes, but now things were different. Arabelle always stayed in style wearing the most beautiful clothes. So while although we are identical twin sisters, whenever we stand next to each other, she would be like a queen and I would be a maid. She easily got everything I ever wished for. Princess bed, a large window with a sea view, piano and ballet classes, and an amazing mom and dad. She talked about it all the time, and I got sick hearing it. It seemed like all of the greatest things were not enough for her. She didn't appreciate what they gave her and just always wanted more. If I were her, I would enjoy that dream life with gratitude and respect everything I got. Life was so unfair. Why did Arabelle always have the best while a girl like me was suffering from the day I was born? Adopting one part of a twin made our two new families close. My new family was always visiting Arabelle's big house for barbecues and nice dinners. To be honest, I did not want to go there at all. It was not a simple family meeting. It was just an event for her to show up. Her parents were so nice, and just by looking at the way they treated her, I could tell that they loved her so much. They often patted her head and called her puppy. Arabelle acted all sweet. 
then behind their backs, she said this nickname made her feel sick as she wasn't five. No one seemed to realize the truth. Arabelle was absolutely not as cute as they ever thought. She actually was kind of insolent, haughty, boastful girl, and most of all, she was a fake. I remember one time when her mother's birthday party was taking place. Her mom looked stunning in that gorgeous dress, and people in the room just stayed silent for a while to show they're impressing. Arabelle pretended to be cute and gave tons of compliments to her mom, but as soon as her mom turned her back on us, Arabelle whispered to me, Look at her stupid smile. She is thinking that she really is beautiful, while everyone knows that I'm the one who looks stunning here. I was so sick of her double life. She was so lucky living that great life, but she had no appreciation for what she already had. And she was so fake. One time, I tried to unmask her true colors. I tried to tell my parents and our mutual friend about how she'd acted behind their backs, but they never believed me and just told me to stop being mean and selfish. They didn't understand a thing about her real version and even scolded me. I was the one who deserved that life, not that fake loser girl. That was when I decided to make a bigger plan. I wanted to replace Arabelle and live her life. I started staring at her work and copied her handwriting. I practiced imitating her voice. We sounded pretty similar, so this was easy. I secretly followed her and her lame friends at school so that I could learn all about their hobbies and habits. But my family was not as wealthy as theirs. I could only stand outside the restaurant, the clothing store, or the cinema. Watching Arabelle enjoy the good life just made my determination grow. When our families met up, I made an effort to get to know her parents more. Her mom likes playing the piano, and her dad likes taking care of his bonsai trees. Her mom can't eat seafood, and her dad is allergic to peanut butter. I jotted down every little detail about her life in my planning book. There were a lot of things I needed to learn until I was fully confident that I could become a second Arabelle and successfully replace her. But then, something suddenly happened that made me speed up my plan. This boy called Milo I liked at school started flirting with my sister. And she flirted back! She knew I liked him, but this didn't stop her from agreeing to go on a date with him. She was such a demon! At this point, I couldn't stand her walking around and stealing all the best things I've ever wanted in my life. I had a plan. Back when I was in the orphanage, there was a man who often came to us and said impolitely to the nuns that they should sell him some children to solve their financial worries. Of course, the nuns refused him and kicked him out. He continued to come over a couple of times, and once he gave us his phone number, saying that if any of us got into trouble, we could find him. Then the nun showed up and threatened to call the cops. Well, that was the last time I saw him. I always kept that number because I knew there would be a day I would need it. And that day finally came. I called him and we came up with a plan to solve my Arabelle issue. He sent her an anonymous message telling her to come to a secluded corner in the park to find out some juicy gossip about Milo. Of course, my nosy sister agreed. The man promised my sister would be sent to another place to work to help him earn money, and she wouldn't be harmed. I left a letter at home saying I'd had enough of the poor life and I'd found a better place to go. I told my parents not to be sad and not to look for me. I hid in a corner of the park and waited for my sister to appear. Then, when they took her, I could easily hop into her life and replace her. There would be no more Kirstie anymore, as I would perfectly be back as Arabelle. Well the better version of her. Suddenly, I saw a black car stop in the distance. Two tattooed guys got out of the car. I could see guns in their back. They stopped for a moment to wet a hanky with some liquid thing. This didn't feel right. I knew that this was going way too far. They would hurt my sister, and I was the one who was participating in this sin, and I knew that I would live in guilt for the rest of my life if I ever let it happen. I immediately ran out from where I was hiding, grabbed my sister's hand, and pulled her away. I heard their footsteps right behind us, so I ran as fast as possible to the crowd of people and screamed loudly at the same time to let people around pay attention to us. The other two men probably gave up when we ran into the crowd. After we got back to her home, I told her that I happened to be walking past and overheard the guy saying they were going to kidnap her. Then I just ran to reach her as fast as possible without thinking. She hugged me and thanked me for saving her life. 
She said that she always thought that I didn't like her, and she used to feel that way about me, too. Wow. That moment she came clear that she used to think that I was just a gross, dirty girl and didn't deserve to be around her, and she from time to time tried to pretend herself in front of me just to make me jealous. She was so sorry for her selfish mind and promised to change her character for me. I also told her that sometimes I became so mean because of envy, but facing this dangerous situation made me realize how much she means to me. And I will not let jealousy blind me anymore. Turns out, living a great life was that simple. We just need to talk straight and openly with each other to solve the problems between us. As for my parents, they read the letter I left them and got upset. We had a good talk and I realized I was being the ungrateful one. Yes, so they didn't have as much money as Arabelle's family did, but they were good people who cared about me. Arabelle hadn't been the only selfish one. I'd been selfish too. Life's good, and Arabelle and I are getting on better than ever. Still, the guilt from what I planned eats me up. Should I come clean about what really happened, or should I keep it a secret and carry on like normal? I mean, it's not like anyone was hurt, right? Hi there, I'm Flora, Portside High School cheerleading captain and beauty pageant queen. My natural beauty and charisma mean that everyone's drawn to me, but hey, I don't make it easy for them. I only allow a select few to get close to me as I can't be seen associating with just anyone. Only my classmate Nina is pretty enough to have the coveted position of my BFF. Birds of a feather flock together, right? My high school life was perfect. But then, in the space of one day, that all changed. The principal, Mrs. Harrington, told me that due to my cheerleading abilities, I'd won a scholarship to the ACL Academy, a boarding school for the athletically gifted. And I was leaving today! Huh? This made no sense! I mean, I don't even do sports! I rushed straight home to discuss it with my mom and found her sitting on the couch surrounded by a load of shopping bags. Yep. She'd already spent the scholarship money before I'd even found out the news. I know mom loves money, but how could she make such a huge decision about my life without discussing it with me first? Ugh. Looks like I had no choice but to leave Portside High behind and go to this stupid sports school. Whatever. I'm a skilled cheerleader after all. It'd be a breeze, right? Wrong. This new school sucked. On my very first day here, I was woken up at 6 a.m. and forced to run five laps around the stadium. God. Are these people superheroes or what? How are they able to run and laugh at the same time while I am panting like crazy? I didn't have time to catch my breath when the teacher made us move to the gym to lift weights. After three hours in the hellish gym, I barely had time to digest my lunch before they steered me into the volleyball court. Yep, that's the sport mom had registered me for. Ugh, this stupid sport. Finally, nighttime arrived, and I managed to crawl my aching body back to my dorm. God save me from this living nightmare! Suddenly, the door opened, and in stepped my three roomies, aka my volleyball teammates. Honestly, I don't even know if I could call them girls or not. One has super short cropped bangs, one doesn't say much and shuffles more than walks, and one wears clothes so baggy they resemble a tent. Obviously, I'm way out of their league. And you know what they all have in common? They're always sweaty. So gross. Come to think of it, I have to go take a shower ASAP. Otherwise, I might turn into one of them. Fresh out of the shower, I called Nina and blurted out how exhausted I was and how much I missed our school. Who are you? You must be so tired. Oh, by the way, I have some amazing news to tell you. There's a city beauty pageant coming up, and I'm representing the school. What? But I won the school beauty contest. Yeah, you did. But you don't attend Portside High anymore, so seeing as I came second, they've given me the spot. Too bad, as you definitely would have won. What? How unfair. I was still in shock when the dorm supervisor stormed in and took away my phone. Uh, yeah, I forgot to mention. This school even has a strict 10 p.m. phones away and lights off rule. It's all because they believe health is the most precious thing for an athlete. I tossed and turned all night. This beauty pageant was massive, and there's no way I could miss it. But I'm not at Portside High anymore. Instead, I'm stuck in this dumb jock academy. Hmm, 
If only I could get out of here. Huh, that's right. I have a brilliant idea. I need to get expelled. So, I decided to skip practice and go cause some havoc for three days straight. I poured paint into the pool, cut off the badminton strings, deflated all of the soccer balls, and of course, I made sure that the security cameras caught it all. And as expected, the principal eventually called me into his office. Yes, this was the moment I was waiting for. Soon I could pack and get out of here. Only the rest didn't exactly go to plan. If it had not been for Mrs. Harrington. Two laps of frog jumps around the soccer field, now. What? Frog jumps? I hate those things. Why couldn't he just kick me out already? But wait, what does Mrs. Harrington have to do with this? After my punishment, I needed to vent. So, hugging my aching thighs, I called Nina to complain about my failed plan. And she just burst out laughing. <laughs> oh, Flora, those outdated tricks were never gonna work. You have to do something bold, like... <gasps> oh my god, Nina is a genius. The next night, following Nina's instructions, I sneaked out when everyone was asleep. That's right, I'm going to wake the whole school up with these firecrackers. I lit one in the dorm's backyard, then ran to hide behind the bushes. Three, two, one, and silence. Huh? I went back to check and saw that it had gone out. What's wrong? Is this one broken? I tried again and again, but the same thing happened each time. As if a ghost did it? Just the thought of it sent chills down my spine, so I sprinted right back to my room. Okay, so not only had my plan been a massive fail, but it had left me super tired. Needless to say, this morning's run was not fun. Zombie alert! Hmm, how come they look even more exhausted than me? Hey, have you guys heard about the doomed jock? He's the ghost in the dorm's backyard. Allegedly, he attended this academy years ago and he exercised himself to death right there in the dorm's backyard. So now, he haunts it. What was she talking about? Could it be the one who messed with me yesterday? Was the doomed jock? I couldn't just give up like that. I needed to figure out a way to get out of this awful place before this ghost got me. Hmm, how about starting a fight? I heard that the fencing team and basketball team were the two toughest groups in the school. So, I sprayed paint on their fencing masks and punctured all of the basketballs, and left a fencing sword at the scene. Then I wrote both teams an anonymous letter. Sunday, 2 p.m., abandoned building near the back gate. When Sunday came, I hid in the abandoned house and waited for the two groups to arrive. Look at their tense faces, this was gonna be fun! I quickly called the cops, and then took advantage of the chaos to blend in with the feuding teams. I almost got punched in the face when, fortunately, the cops got there just in time, causing everyone to frantically flee the scene. I happily ran to a cop. It's me! I started this fight! But, to my surprise, the cop just asked if I was hurt. Then he hurriedly chased after the gang. Only then I realized that if I wanted to be caught, I had to do exactly what they did. Run away! Oh man... I was staggering my way back to the dormitory, feeling deflated, when I spotted the fencing and basketball teams coming my way. Freaked out, I looked around for a place to hide, but there was only one car parked on the side of the road. With no other way, I ventured to open the car door and, oh, it wasn't locked. I quickly jumped in, hid under the back seat, and lay completely still. At that moment, the car door swung open. I closed my eyes and braced myself to catch some hands, when suddenly the car revved up and left. Looking up, I saw the principal sitting in the driver's seat, whistling happily. Oh, so it was his car. After a while, the car stopped in front of a bar in town. Didn't expect a serious man like him to go to such places. But wait, an underage student being caught by the principal here would surely get me expelled, right? With that in mind, I hurriedly followed him. But at the door, a security guard stopped me and asked for my ID card. I had no idea what to do when suddenly a strange guy appeared. Hey cutie, need an ID card? How about this? I'll lend you a fake ID to get in. In exchange, you must go out with me tonight. Sounds good, huh? 
Well, I didn't plan on sticking around for long, as I would just get in, find the principal, and get caught right away anyway, so I nodded in agreement. I was about to take the ID card from him when someone yanked me back and pushed me into a cab. My roommates! What are you doing here? Do you know you've just ruined my plan and- Ruined? Who's the one causing trouble here? Do you honestly believe that if you get expelled like that, your old school will take you back? <sighs> Fat chance. Huh? How'd you know that I'm trying to get expelled? Turns out my roommates overheard the conversation between me and Nina. It was them who extinguished my firecrackers in the campus backyard, then made up the doomed jock ghost story to make me stay away from there. Then, when the basketball and fencing team searched for me, it was them who lied that I was with them all day so I could get away with it. But what did you do that for? Don't get us wrong, we didn't do it for you. We did it to protect the school's reputation. Then they started telling me that, for the last few years, due to bad achievements, our school was on the chopping block to make space for industrial areas. The only way to convince the city council to keep our school was by winning the state's upcoming sports competition. We've all played sports for all of our lives. Sport is everything to us. If our school closes, we don't know where we'd go. That's why when we saw you being lazy and messing about, we couldn't just sit back and watch. Oh, I had no idea about this. Suddenly, I felt so guilty. I mean, of course I don't want to ruin their futures. I then also opened up to them and told them all about the beauty pageant. They insisted there must be a way to join the pageant without returning to my old school. So they searched around on Google, and guess what? Turns out the pageant accepts free candidates too, which means no school registration needed. What else could I wish for? I immediately signed up for it, and as a thank you to my new friends, I started making an effort at playing volleyball. I'm a tall girl, so my training position is a right side hitter. And you know what? There is this satisfaction whenever I was able to block a ball. Not gonna lie, this is much more interesting than I thought. That weekend, I went to the city to pick out some dresses for the beauty contest. I found myself immersed in racks of gorgeous gowns when a familiar voice startled me. How about this one, Mom? Stunning, sweetie. You're the most beautiful girl in this world. I don't know what possessed them to pick Flora over you, but no need to worry this time, as I have sent her far away. Yeah, that's where she belongs. I'll show them who's the true beauty queen now. What? No way! My old school principal is Nina's mom? And transferring me to the sports academy was part of her plan? Just so her daughter could go to the pageant? I was fuming. So as soon as Mrs. Harrington went outside to take a call, I walked straight over to confront Nina. I can't believe you're like that. Nina looked shocked at first, but then smirked as she said, Like what? Like someone who's far prettier, more talented, and crown-worthy than you? Thanks, sporty girl. I shoved past her and stormed out of there. Wait for it, Nina. We'll soon see who the real winner is. The next few weeks were crazy busy with volleyball practice and the pageant preparations. I may have only been a reserve, but I still wanted to give it my all to motivate the team. The sports competition soon arrived, and after two days of competing, the fate of the school came down to the final match. Our volleyball game! Talk about intense. It sucked it was on the same day as the beauty pageant, as I would have loved to be able to cheer them on from the player bench. But then, disaster struck. The girl who plays right side hitter sprained her wrist and couldn't play. The whole team looked so worried and that made my heart ache. There was only one thing for it. I'd replace her. If I was quick, I could still make it to the beauty pageant afterward. Come on, Flora, stay focused. Just one point left and we'd win. Suddenly the ball came flying at me. This was it. I hit it with all my might and Score! We won! I was busy celebrating our victory when everyone suddenly asked me about the beauty pageant. Oh my god! I almost forgot! The match went on longer than I thought it would. My friends dragged me into the taxi, but when we got there, the show was already coming to an end. And worst of all, guess who was standing there wearing the winner's crown and looking all smug? Yep, Nina. Did you come to congratulate me? Thanks, bestie. Oh, you guys must be Flora's new friends. 
Hmm, that figures. How cute. Stop the act, Nina. Yes, they are my friends. They're not fake, and they're a thousand times more interesting than you. <laughs> Say whatever you want, but I'm a beauty queen now, and you're no longer at the same level as me. My friends started clenching their fists, so I quickly pulled them away before anything happened. Right at that time, an announcement came across the speaker. Attention, pageants. We've just discovered signs of voter fraud. Please stay inside the hall and await further confirmation. About 30 minutes later, the truth finally came out. Turns out, Nina's mom had paid for the voting texts. Needless to say, Nina had her crown taken off her immediately, and Mrs. Harrington also lost her principal job. <laughs> what goes around comes around, right? As for me, I'm not bothered about beauty pageants anymore. Instead, I have a new hobby, volleyball. Turns out I'm pretty good at it, and who knows, I might even become a professional player. And you know what the best part of all this is? I now have true friends by my side who I know will be willing to help me anytime and anywhere. I can't believe I'm standing here in the middle of this frenzied concert with a crowd of crazy fans cheering for this Isaac guy, who I don't even care about. Hi. I'm Hazel, by the way. When I agreed with my friends to go on this road trip all the way to Carolina to attend a skydiving festival, well, this wasn't exactly what I was expecting. Yeah, that's them, Ivy and Zoe. The girls who tricked me into thinking this, their idols concert, was the opening of the festival. There I was, eagerly awaiting some amazing aerial display or something, but instead, I was stuck in Fanville. Ugh. Why were they so loud? My hearing better not be permanently damaged from this. And as you can see, being the only calm one here, they placed me in charge of their fan cams. Worse still, why did I specifically order these custom matching hoodies for us all? It made me look like I was part of these groupies. Finally, this din was over, but I was stuck amongst the slow walking fans. And where were my friends? I couldn't even call them as my battery had died. Hmm, I'll just get a taxi back to our Airbnb rental, then contact them from there. I'm too exhausted anyway. Let's just get out of this place ASAP, forget about this chaotic night, as I'll be having a bird's eye view of the world at the actual Fall Fest tomorrow. And that's all that matters. Wow, this festival had everything going for it, from attentive service, amazing live music, and great food. It was so worth enduring that awful concert for. Everything was going great, until I saw Ivy's panicked face. Girls, it's our beloved Isaac. After the concert last night, he disappeared with a mysterious girl. Look at this hoodie. Does it seem familiar to you? Oh my god, that's one of our custom-made group hoodies. Could it be? I could clearly see Zoe's suspicious gaze on me and Ivy. What's that look for? Are you suspecting me? Well, whatever. It wasn't me, that's for sure. Ivy, you took way too long to get back to the car last night. As for you, Hazel, you were unreachable for ages. Jeez, my battery died. I told you both this. And I have nothing to do with your precious idol. Besides, if any of us did run away with him, then we'd hardly be standing here, would we? Anyway, you two can stay here and doubt each other if you want, but I'm going skydiving. Then I stormed off. It's so frustrating that I've been dragged into this. My phone only died thanks to their stupid fan cams. That's enough. <sighs> Let's just forget about it. I won't let anything ruin this moment. Guys, look! I'm amongst the clouds! 10,000 feet above the ground and my breath is literally taken away. No matter how many times I've done this, it still feels just as thrilling as the first time. This adrenaline rush was crazy! Whoa, that was amazing! Thank goodness I managed to capture some spectacular footage of the beautiful city of Chester. Hang on. When I was close to landing, my camera spotted a familiar face. Zoe. Um, wasn't she meant to be preparing to fly? So why was she talking to someone in the parking lot? It was really weird. Looking closer, the strange man was... Isaac, the missing singer! 
I didn't see it wrong, did I? I immediately called Ivy and we quickly ran to the parking lot. Gotcha! You better have a good reason for this. Isaac? Are you really... So, you're the one who ran away with him last night? Zoe couldn't say a word at that point and kept trying to avoid eye contact with us. But eventually, under the harsh questioning from Ivy, she found her voice and told us everything. So, last night, when we were separated in the after-concert chaos, Zoe was trying to find us when she accidentally bumped into a guy in disguise. Guess what? Yep, it was none other than Isaac McGuire in the flesh. She almost screamed out his name, so he immediately covered her mouth and dragged her away. Realizing that Isaac was being chased, Zoe then put her hood up to cover her face and followed him without a question. This hectic schedule was just too much. I can't even remember the last time I had proper time for myself anymore. I need a break. Ugh, and I didn't care. But Ivy sure looked like she was going to drop a tear for her poor idol any second now. Well, you see? It's an emergency. I couldn't help but give him a hand. Then, we've already parted ways last night, but... But my manager has been able to track me down, so we had to run away ASAP. All I have with me is this phone, so I really need your help. And that's when we start to hear some whispers. Someone seemed to have recognized Isaac, so without delay, we immediately jumped into the car. But, huh? Who on earth was sitting next to me? Jeez, this girl's makeup was so flashy, and her perfume was so strong it made my throat lump up. Siren! You're Siren, aren't you? Oh, I adore your chemistry with Isaac in the movie. It's like you guys were born for each other. But, wait, are you two running away together? It turned out that the flamboyant girl was Siren, an emerging actress who was filming a movie with Isaac. Looking at the way she blushed while Isaac remained silent and didn't deny it, it was clear that they were a couple who took their romance off screen. Hmm, busy schedule? Exhausted? Nonsense. Obviously, he was just making excuses to spend time with his girlfriend. Oh my, you're even more beautiful in real life. Your face is a gift from heaven. OMG, Ivy needed to stop. Looking at Siren's smug face, she was clearly big-headed enough without any more flattery. But nope, Ivy continued gushing out a river of compliments at her. I mean, does she seriously like this actress that much? Um, your nose is so pretty from up close. Where'd you get your nose job? Hearing that, Siren immediately stopped smiling and covered her nose in annoyance, which almost made me burst out laughing. Chin shaving surgery, lip filler, nose job. How could she even act with such a stiff face? Sorry to bother everyone, but staying at a hotel is not a good idea right now. Can you guys help us find alternative accommodation? Yes, yes, yes. I volunteer to help you two. I watched in disgust as Ivy and Zoe frantically called and texted their acquaintances, but no one could help. Suddenly, Ivy turned to me and gave me her puppy dog eyes look. Hazel, you're our last hope. You must help us, please. Oh, not that again. Ivy knows I can't say no to her when she makes that pleading face. Okay, fine. Even though I didn't want to, I agreed to let them come to my family's suburban house for a few days. It'll only be a few days. I didn't want any of my family members to know I'd been there. Wow, I can't believe I hadn't been here in 10 years. This place held some of my childhood's good memories, but also some not so good ones. Especially one haunting one. <sighs> um, why didn't you tell us that your family is loaded? It would be so nice to live in a huge mansion like this. But it seems like your family doesn't come here often. It's so cold and cheerless. Yeah, he's right. Ever since that day, this place was never a home to me anymore, but just a hollow house of gloom. I was still lost in my thoughts when a deafening sound of something breaking came from upstairs. We all rushed upstairs to see what all the noise was about, and found Siren standing there in my parents' bedroom, a broken vase at her feet, and worse still, she was wearing my mom's dress. Take it off right now! 
Siren just shrugged, stepped over the broken vase pieces, then strutted across the room and even stopped to pose at the end. Puff, it's just an old dress. Why so serious? I was so furious that on her walk back, I tripped her up, causing her to fall flat on the floor. Isaac hurriedly helped her up, and she hid behind his back and did her whole crocodile tears act, saying I was picking on her. Oh, please. I'd had quite enough of this drama queen for one day, so I was about to lunge at her to teach her a lesson, but Isaac blocked me. Excuse, Siren. That was immature of her, but I suggest you should calm down first. That's right, Hazel. The two of them didn't bring any personal belongings. Anyway, Siren was just a bit careless. You'd better watch your girlfriend closely. Change your clothes. Never touch my mom's stuff again. Got it? Now I'll arrange the rooms for all of us. Well, there were only two usable bedrooms here, since most of them were dusty and unfurnished. So I took the couch and gave one room to my friends, and the other room to the loving couple. But as Siren gave a satisfied look and took Isaac's hand to lead him to their room, he just shook her away and said I could have the bed, and he'd take the couch. No, the couch is mine! I didn't want to share a bed with her! But Isaac ignored my protests and plopped down onto the couch to claim it. Zoe and Ivy quickly scurried upstairs. They caused this mess, yet it's clear neither of them was bold enough to share a room with Siren. What a bunch of annoying, obnoxious celebs! Anyway, I was exhausted. It was time for me to hit the sack. That girl better not snore. Siren started playing some dumb white noises, then instantly fell asleep. Me, on the other hand, even after turning off that weird lullaby of hers, I kept on tossing and turning. Ugh! It was no use. Sleep wasn't happening. So, I left the room to get some air. I was about to go downstairs to get some water when I heard a piano playing. Oh, heart and soul. It had been so long since I'd heard these beautiful melodies. The music carried me to a room where the silhouettes of a man passionately playing the piano came into sight. Oh, memories. I loved nothing more than sitting next to my dad and playing happy songs with him. But then, everything fell apart. And I hadn't touched the piano since, well... <sighs> until today, I sat down next to him and let my fingers glide over the keys. I was immersed in the harmonious melodies of the music and let the notes take me back to the past until a scream snapped me out of it. What on earth are you two doing? You are probably wondering why all eyes are on us. This is nothing new. Actually, this pretty much always happens when we walk through school together. Look, they're truly the high school version of Kim K and Paris Hilton, aren't they? Agreed. They're quite charming. Yeah, that's us. I'm Robin, and the Hilton to my Kardashian is Allison, my BFF. Don't let her snooty look fool you. She's actually a really nice girl who's always there for me. I never had to worry about a thing being with her. We've basically been inseparable since forever. Ugh. Candace, you so did that on purpose. Oops, sorry. It's just too hard for my eyes to notice something as lame as you. <laughs> oh, really? So it has nothing to do with the fact you're afraid I'll take your cheerleading spot and beauty queen title? As if. You're no competition for me. <sighs> this wasn't a new thing. Because Allison is so beautiful and talented, she often gets into altercations with the jealous mean girls. Now, thanks to the Candace drama, we're late for class. We were hurrying along the corridor when suddenly Allison stopped. A poster caught our eyes. It was for the contest to find the new cheerleading captain. Perfect! I can't wait to win and wipe that smug grin off Candace's face. You... you're gonna register too? Of course I am. I'm gonna teach that girl a lesson. Just you wait and see. Oh, snap. The truth is, um, I had also signed up for the competition and was waiting for the right time to tell Allison, but who knew she would suddenly become so determined to win this? If Allison found out I was going to be her rival, what would she think? Ugh, what should I do? 
I don't want to upset her, but I really need to win this competition too. Why, you ask? It's for one person. It was him, Steve, the basketball team captain, and also Allison's cousin. I've had a huge crush on him, but the problem is that he's not exactly short on fangirls, including Candace. I'd never be as forward as her, so I just watched him from afar. But what if I'm no longer a nobody and become the cheerleading captain? Then Steve would notice me, and I'd be confident enough to open my heart to him. Right? But things were way too difficult when I have to face up to not only Candace, the resident mean girl, but also Allison, my BFF. Great! It's true what they say. Putting something off will definitely come to bite you eventually. As I was having lunch with Allison in the cafeteria, Candace and her friends stopped in front of our table. So, you think you can compete with us? Go on then, eat up and grow strong, little girl. If you have a problem with me, then deal with me. Leave my friend alone. Okay, princess, not everything is about you. I'm talking to her. Oh wait, look at this lost puppy. Hasn't Robin right here told you that she's also competing for the cheerleading captain position? Then Candace and her friends left, leaving me to face Allison's surprise and anger. I... I was planning to... You really want to compete against me? I just want to try. I... Wow. I never expected you to stab me in the back like this. Unbelievable! Then she stormed off, leaving me there feeling dumbfounded, staring at my ruined lunch. I know I should have told her in the first place, but her reaction was way worse than I expected. For the rest of that day, I couldn't find her anywhere. Not at school, not at her house. So before going to bed, I texted her, saying how sorry I was, and that I also had my side of the story, which I would tell her all about, but only after the contest. This was just a little misunderstanding. My awesome Allison would forgive me by the break of dawn, right? But nope. After that, Allison started treating me like I was invisible. No matter how hard I tried to talk to her, she wouldn't listen and just said, I don't need any explanation, backstabber. Drop out of the contest, then we'll talk. Drop out? No way! I mean, I really need this. And hang on, why couldn't I try out? So what? I kept it a secret from her. Was I supposed to tell her every single thing that I did? It was so upsetting to see us falling apart like this, but I had to sort out my priorities too. So as heartbreaking as it was, I had to put aside this temporarily broken friendship to strive for the biggest goal right now, the captain title. I poured all my focus into cheer practice and often stayed late so I could hone my skills. All my hard work paid off when the teacher complimented my technique. Meanwhile, Allison only received negative feedback. I turned to give her an encouraging smile, but she gave me a hateful look back. Did she think I was the cause of her poor form or what? I was about to leave when Allison walked in. I said hi, but she just ignored me. Seeing that, Candace didn't miss her chance to mock us. Being betrayed by your best friend must suck. Oh dear, if it was me, I wouldn't be able to go to school. Allison angrily slammed the locker door shut and walked straight out of there, while Candace and her friends were laughing. Ugh, they were the worst. The day of the competition finally came and I was so nervous. But hang on, I couldn't spot Allison anywhere. I was trying to look for her when I heard my name over the loudspeaker. It's my turn already. I was backstage on standby when suddenly I heard someone talking about Allison having an accident and not being able to attend the competition. Oh my god, Allison, is she okay? But before I could run over to ask them more questions, I was pushed out to the stage. The music was already playing, but I felt too overwhelmed and anxious to start. Sensing my nerves, the whole stand gave me a round of applause to cheer me on. I looked down at the audience and took a deep breath, tried to concentrate, and started my performance. As soon as the music ended, the whole room burst into endless applause. The judges nodded and smiled at me. I was too worried about Allison to celebrate, so right after my performance, I rushed over to her house to check. But she didn't welcome me at all. How dare you show your face here? Not after what you did! What do you mean? I 
heard that you fell, so I rushed here right after the competition. Stop the act. I know you snuck up behind me and pushed me yesterday. Thanks to you, I had to quit the contest. What is she saying? Allison disappeared off upstairs. I rushed over to help her, but she pushed me over. Go away! We're not friends anymore. I was so upset that I burst into tears. And when I got up from the ground, I saw Steve standing at the bottom of the stairs. Did he see it all? I was so embarrassed that I fled as quickly as possible. And things didn't stop getting worse. I've never been so scared to go to school before in my life. It's all thanks to the school forum post accusing me of pushing Allison. Now my voting rank has dropped, and kids I don't even know are giving me dirty looks. Suddenly, Steve came up from nowhere and started talking to me. Allison hasn't been in a right mood recently. I'm sorry on her behalf. This was not a dream, right? Steve had never bothered with me before, so why now? For you, this is a lucky pouch containing Feng Shui gemstones. If you wish for something, confess to the pouch a sin of yours and the wish will come true. It's proportional to each other. The bigger the sin, the grander the wish. But use it carefully. As either opened or overused, it will weaken its energy. I watched as Steve turned his back and left. This was such a sweet thing for him to do. Especially as everyone else was treating me like I was a walking plague cloud or something. But did this pouch really have magic powers? I guess there's only one way to find out, right? I call upon the magical powers of this pouch to confess that I purposely hid the flashy dress mom bought me, then lied that I'd lost it so I wouldn't have to wear it. I'm so sorry. I wish I'll get a good grade for my chemistry test tomorrow so she'll be happy. After making the wish, I carefully put it in my backpack, hoping tomorrow during the test it would work. But no, the last question was pretty much impossible. I sighed, thinking the A was about to slip out of my hand, when suddenly Kevin, the smartest guy in class, threw me a piece of paper when the teacher didn't notice. I stealthily opened it. Whoa, it was the answer to that one question I had left. I quickly filled in my paper without thinking any further. A few days after, I got my test results, and I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw an A in front of me. It must be the powers of the magic pouch, as normally Kevin didn't even talk to me. Fascinating. And so, I made a few more wishes, and they all came true. Once I even confessed that I accidentally spilled water and damaged my computer, and wished Mum would buy me a new one. Unbelievably, two days later, Mum bought me a MacBook and said it was an early birthday present. This pouch was a miracle, so it was time I used it for my most important wish. I call upon the magical powers of this pouch to confess that I kept this secret from Allison and practiced every night, then signed up for the cheerleader competition. I want to win just because I long for Steve's attention and to gain the confidence to confess to him. Please help her recover quickly and for us to make up and be as close as ever. After wishing, I breathed a sigh of relief. It felt good to finally get this all off my chest. The next day after school, I was pretending to be walking past the basketball court as usual when Steve called me over and handed me a bottle of juice. Looks like the pouch really exerts its power. I did- Actually, Robin, there's no magic. I just snuck a mini recorder in that pouch to figure out if you were the one to mess with Allison. I'm sorry. What? In that lucky pouch is a mini recorder? So it also means he heard everything, including my love confession? I blushed cherry red and didn't know how to react when he suddenly sighed. Hey, do you suspect anyone? I still want to find out who the culprit is. Candace? She has a grudge against Allison. <laughs> Candace, then I have a way. See you around. Since I found out that Steve knew I liked him, I've been wondering why he didn't give me a reaction back. Maybe his silence is rejection? As soon as I entered the cafeteria, I saw the crowd rushing around. Oh my god. It's Steve and... And Candace with linked arms! Wait, what was that in her hand? It sure looked a lot like a lucky pouch. Could it be? While Candace wasn't paying attention, Steve turned his head around, smiled, then winked at me. Oh, that's it! 
Steve was just acting so he could get information from her. The day after, Steve invited me to the treehouse in his garden to listen to Candace's recording. But it turns out, Candace was not the culprit that caused Allison's accident either. She just admitted to some nonsense slurs and pranks and wished to win the championship and for Steve to love and spoil her. Then who is it? Somehow Allison keeps insisting it's you. Hmm, how about you give Allison the pouch? I want to listen to her feelings too. And so, the magic pouch was also passed on to Allison. The next evening, after my late practice, Steve and I went to the park nearby to listen to Allison's confessions. Dear Magic Spell Pouch, I... I actually didn't fall. Robin was getting so good and I... Um... I wasn't confident that I'd win and losing to her would be humiliating. So... I spread the news that I had an accident so I didn't have to participate and blamed everything on her. Everyone loves her. Even Steve has a secret rush on her. Well, me? W what? That means it was all planned by Allison? And Steve had a crush on me? Is that true? My thoughts are all over the place right now. Then before I could blurt out a word, he took my hand to go to Allison's house. What is this, Allison? Can you explain this? So what? Why does such an ordinary girl like her get so many good things? I deserve it, not her! Allison, why? Without even letting me finish my sentence, Allison slammed the door shut. At least I knew the truth now, right? Even though it sure was ugly, I really have nothing left now. I lost my best friend, and with only one more day until the voting for the contest comes to an end, it looks like Candace will win. But as soon as I stepped into the classroom, everybody rushed over to me and waved their phones in my face. Huh? Oh, there's a new post on the school forum. It turns out that Allison shared the truth, and even apologized to me. I knew it. My bestie is always a very kind person. Thanks to that, my vote soared and got to first place. And this is the moment I've been waiting for. The new leader of our cheerleading team is... Robin Smith. Through my ecstatic grin, I noticed someone standing from afar. It's Allison. Seeing me, she hurried away, but luckily I was able to catch her up. Allison, thank you. I'm sorry for hurting you like that. No, I'm the one at fault. I... I... Although it was awkward at first, we soon got past this, then managed to talk straight to each other. Allison apologized for everything, then she congratulated me and gave me a hug. Oh, right. Now that I'm the winner, I can confidently confess my feelings to Steve, right? <laughs> no need, because he already did that to me. Thank you for staying beside me. But, Steve, I still wonder how that bag could fulfill all my wishes. The other things are understandable, but the MacBook was unreal. Um, yeah. I may have called your mom pretending to be the teacher and told her that a MacBook for studying was compulsory. Hey, I'm Connor, and I'm currently taking a well-deserved break from studying to hang out with my friends. I go to college at the Georgia Institute of Tech, and I'm sure to be a top-notch architect one day soon. Now I just have one thing to deal with, then I can properly enjoy my night off. Oh, here she is. Connor, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to hurt you, but sorry. We should stop seeing each other. Ah, well, every ending is a new beginning. <laughs> Cheers. I was the master of getting girlfriends I'm tired of to break up with me. It was great. As this way, no one could ever accuse me of being a bad boy. <sighs> what to do now? I reluctantly had to find a new challenge then. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to turn this in. Um, that's okay. Just trying to find one more paper. Uh, um, what's your name? <laughs> I'm Connor. Hi. Hmm, her sparkling eyes, her shiny hair, her soft hands. But ugh, why was suddenly some nerd dragging me away from the hot girl and into a corner? Before I could ask him what was going on, he started waving a photo of this girl in my face. So it turns out this dude is called Patrick, and the girl in the photo is Paige, his girlfriend. Their parents are both influential sorts and organize their whole engagement. 
Sounds great, right? I mean, she's pretty cute. But no, he wanted me to find a way to make Paige break up with him. I've heard a lot about you. I, I need your help. I can't do this myself. <laughs> huh? Sure, I get it. A real man will never be the one to break up first. I might be able to help, but first, let's see what kind of person she is. The conversation started to become super serious. From the sound of it, this page girl was a genuine, good-natured girl with a vulnerable side. So this needed to be handled with extra care, so that there wouldn't be any awkward family provocations for my clients. Hmm, perhaps, nah, this way wouldn't work. Neither would that way. I was about to give up when suddenly Patrick stacked a pack of money, approximately a thousand dollars on the table. Help me, then it's all yours. Whoa, that was a lot of money to me. It would get me the magnificent PS5 of my dreams. <sighs> Besides, with my charm and handsome looks, I could make Paige fall in love with me and leave Patrick in no time. Genius! My debut had to be spectacular, so I looked online and hired some people pretending to be thugs to block Paige's path. Then I'd waltz in and rescue her. The plan was all set, so I leisurely walked to the rendezvous spot, but... Oh no! Who knew those guys were real thugs? They threatened us. Asked us to hand over all our belongings, then forced us to go to some abandoned warehouse. Oh my god, the $1,000 was so not worth losing my life for. Yes, I was somewhat afraid, but my flirtatious instinct kicked in, and I turned to Paige and started talking to her. Oh man, she's super sweet. And I noticed that when she talks about something that interests her, she crinkles her nose. She's so cute, but most of all, she's really smart. Why, you ask? Because just an hour later, the cops showed up and arrested the thugs. Turns out, before Paige handed over her belongings, she quickly texted the thug's license plate to a friend and asked her to call the cops. Phew! And, luckily for me, thanks to this destiny meeting, I got a little more information about her and learned that Paige was planning to learn Spanish to major in tourism there. But there's one more important thing. That is, I think, I have a crush on her. She's not like any other girl I've met before. I want to win her heart, truly, not just because of the plan. It will be the best of both worlds. Patrick gets to be free of Paige, as requested, but she won't end up a lovelorn girl because she'll have a new handsome boyfriend by her side. Yep, that'll be me. <laughs> there was just one problem. In all the commotion of the day, I'd forgotten to ask Paige for her number. Oops. I had asked Patrick for it and then texted her, but sadly didn't receive a response. Hmm. I needed to be smart about this. So I decided to pretend to be a Spanish tutor. Yeah, I can't speak Spanish, but with my charm, that's no big deal, right? I created a flashy profile and told Patrick to pretend to surf and accidentally find me. Then show Paige. And so, ding! Hola, yo soy Professor Connor. But wait, sheesh! If only I'd studied Spanish harder in high school. And now the extent of my Spanish were just a few words I'd picked up from binge-watching Money Heist. So I just copied down Spanish lessons off YouTube and taught these to Paige. I don't know if it's because of my teaching skills or my charisma, but Paige seemed to think I was legit. <laughs> However, my flirting tricks weren't going so well. I knew she liked me. I mean, who wouldn't like me? Besides, she gave me these cute looks and laughed at my jokes. Our chemistry was undeniable. So when I reached over and placed my hand on top of hers, I felt sparks fly. But then she gave me this awkward look and moved her hand away. She liked me, right? So why was she acting like this? I never failed at flirting. Feeling frustrated, I was trudging my way up the street when, huh? Was that Patrick happily holding hands with a girl? I recognized the long hair. It was Paige. Ugh, why can't she drop her lousy boyfriend already? And why won't she date me instead? I was about to leave, but the more I thought about it, the more resentful I became. So I bribed a little boy to run up to Paige and say, Why aren't you with Connor, you cheater? Mean, huh? But haha, <laughs> Patrick would be pleased as he now had a legitimate excuse to break up with her anyway. But when the girl turned around, I realized that she wasn't Paige. The poor girl looked completely dumbfounded. Patrick started yelling at her and pulling on her arm so hard she almost fell over. Huh? Where's the nerd Patrick? And that wasn't cool at all. Then he raised his hand to hit her, but I zoomed in front of him. Stop! No reason to hit a woman, bro! Patrick immediately grabbed my collar. You dare play tricks with my Becky, huh? Seeing that, the shocked girl quickly ran away. No, no, I thought it was Paige, so I hired the boy just to give you an excuse to break up with her. Calm down, bro. Patrick reassessed the situation, then he cleared his throat and said, <coughs> Oh, well, uh, I was bored of Becky anyway, thanks. 
I was still shocked by this jerky side of Patrick when he immediately said, By the way, you can stop the plan with Paige. I decided I like her now. Lately, she's been so full of life and less clingy. He told me he would still pay me, then he hopped into a taxi. Ugh, that's the version of Paige when she's with me. I gave her that zest of life, you jerk. Whatever. From this day forth, he was no longer my client, and I didn't want his stupid money. <sighs> it was time I told Paige what Patrick was really like, so I arranged to meet her in a cafe and told her everything. But when she got over the initial shock, she snapped at me. I know this is all part of your twisted fabrication. I mean, you lied about speaking Spanish, and now you're just making up stories to break Patrick and me up. Then she threw my textbook back at me and stormed off. Oh man, that Patrick is such a slimeball. But I couldn't blame her for believing him over me. I'd seen firsthand how much of a wolf in sheep's clothing he was. I tried to find proof to show Paige, but that jerk sure covered his tracks. His whole nerdy bookworm facade was flawless. And he was still this sluggish nerd, wobbly clutching the bus handle to go to school every day. Ugh, what a con man. Just you wait, Patrick. It's time the world saw your true face. With such determination, I continued to spy on him around town. Then one time, like every other day, I was on duty when a group stopped me, accompanied by Patrick pointing at me. Here's our sandbag! Uh-oh, looks like I was busted. The whole group gathered around me, fists ready. Yeah, I was pretty terrified. There's no way I could fight off a group this size. I raised my fists and prepared for pain, but then someone shouted, Stop! It was Paige. Suddenly, Patrick immediately changed his attitude and ordered the group to leave. He told Paige that I stole his stuff and his friends were helping him get it back. What? The swine! Connor isn't a thief. I know it for sure. There must be some misunderstanding. Please don't accuse him like that. Patrick's face changed. He grabbed Paige's hand and pulled her away, saying, We're getting engaged at the end of this month. Say no more. Okay, so I may have gate-crashed their engagement party, but I did hide at the back while the speeches were going on. Then, to my surprise, as Patrick was talking, they both spotted me. Then Paige turned to him and shook her head. It hurt to see her like this. Perhaps she changed her mind. What do you mean? Is this because of Connor? Paige kept quiet, while Patrick's parents were furious. How dare you cheat on my son? Who do you think you are? Paige, why is this happening? Really, Paige, say something. Feeling the pressure and injustice of it all, poor Paige looked distraught as she desperately tried to hold back her tears. I really couldn't stand seeing her like that, so I jumped out of the crowd to come to her defense. Everyone calm down. Paige is the sweetest, most amazing girl, and she deserves better than this jerk. Don't listen to him. He's a thief and a fiancé stealer. I was done listening to this guy's slander. So I threw a punch straight at his smug face. Yeah, the engagement party had sure turned chaotic. I looked at the wreckage in front of me. The consequences that I had caused. Okay, so maybe coming here wasn't my best idea. Actually, this was all my fault for ever agreeing to help Patrick in the first place. Or I shouldn't have been a jerk in the first place. Feeling deflated, I arrived home and saw that I'd received a message from Paige. My heart thudded as I opened it. Thank you for everything and try to practice your Spanish as it's even worse than mine. Goodbye. And that was the last text she sent me. After that, I spent a month trying to contact her but received no reply. So finally, I plucked up my courage to go to Paige's house and was told that she left for Spain earlier than scheduled. Perhaps the shock was so huge that Paige wanted to leave this place as soon as possible. It was all my fault. I was the biggest jerk in this story and now I'd lost the girl. Alas, vengeance is bliss. So I walked inside, went straight to Patrick's table where he was wasted in the arms of a bunch of girls, took a picture, and sent it to his family. What is done by night appears by day, my friend. A few days later, I heard that after being exposed, Patrick's parents had confiscated all of his bank cards. Even his current girlfriend dumped him. Ha! Huh. So that sealed the final breakup deal for my special guest. And now, guess where I'm at? Looking for the girl of my life, duh. And this time, I'm going to make sure I don't screw it up. So, here I am, practicing this tricky pose. I must not fall over. Rosie, straighten your back. Hang in there. You got this. That's Bradley, my yoga instructor. Can you see that? There are more than a dozen people in this class, yet he only seems to encourage me. Did this mean he liked me? 
I didn't need to look in a mirror to know my cheeks were lobster red right now. I'm Rosie, by the way, 18 years old. I'm still single. Not to brag, but I know I'm kind of pretty, friendly, and fun to be around. So it's easy to tell that many guys are into me. But why do none of them ever dare to confess their feelings to me? Hmm, what were they so afraid of? Take Bradley, for instance. He clearly liked me, but was too shy to admit it. It was so obvious as he kept deterring past my mat just so he could check out my position. Even my best friend Joseph noticed that, as every time Bradley approached, Joseph would have this cheeky smirk on and send me signals with his eyes. I already told him not to do that. After class, Joseph kept teasing me about it. He told me Bradley definitely had feelings for me and just needed one more push for leverage. Although I reluctantly told him to stop, he insisted on being the wingman by texting Bradley about me. Bradley, why don't you ask Rosie out? You two look really cute together. Come on, you know that wouldn't work. Huh? <laughs> why not? Because, Joseph, it's you I'm crazy about. I was not okay. What was the problem with all the men around me? Why didn't they like me? I couldn't go on like this. I must have a boyfriend. And I was dead serious about it. So after researching online, I found a dating coach to save me from my tragic single situation. So Martin, my coach, is super handsome, has a six-pack, and his business is a big hit. He's helped hundreds of sad single people find love. Flashy enough to trust, isn't it? Still, I was quite nervous when I met him. You know, the feeling that a therapist would judge you before treating you. But actually, he was reassuring, very open, and didn't ask too many questions. Let's just be open about this, all right? Manipulating someone into dating you is not the foundation to a healthy relationship. But don't worry, as I have the secret. Day one. And according to Martin, I needed to learn how to approach new people. I'm pretty shy, so taking the initiative was hard for me. But Martin taught me a trick. When I see a cute guy, I need to approach him within three seconds. This way my brain wouldn't have time to think, analyze, then talk myself out of it, and end up missing my chance. Okay, a hot guy was there staring at his phone. I must not overthink. One, two, three, go. Hi! Hi? Um, so I just saw you, and I think you're really hot. I'm here to say hi. Thanks for thinking my boyfriend's hot, but he's taken. I panicked, then rushed back to Martin and spluttered out, I, I, I can't. Hey, that was a success. You're just training your mind and body to take action. Go ahead. No way. Should we move to the next step? And this was the next step. I just needed to start a conversation in this place where everyone was in a mood to have a chat. It's simple, Rosie. Put yourself in a talkative mood. Go over to them and give them a compliment. But make sure it's genuine, else it won't count, okay? Got it. I spotted a man sitting alone, so I walked over to him. Hey, I like your... ring. O-M-G. Was that a wedding ring? <laughs> don't, don't worry. I'm single. And is it that hard to think of something to compliment me on? <laughs> and, um, you are smarter than you look. And yep. He left. Oh, what kind of compliment was that? Martin sat in a corner and watched me go from guy to guy and stutter out a string of terrible compliments. You did great, Rosie. Don't be discouraged. Now, when you actually see someone you like, you'll be more natural. Martin said that body language is a crucial part of keeping the conversation going. So, the plan was to practice this at Joseph's birthday party. This time, Martin couldn't be there in person, but we still stayed in touch via my Bluetooth earphone so he could guide me. The mission today was to initiate physical contact with someone and make them feel close to me. Anyone who knows me knows that I am not good with these things. So I kept giving them this weird slap on the back. Hey, I heard an ouch. Are you hitting them? I said just a light tap. I don't think I can do this. I'm too shy. And now guys are giving me weird looks. Martin said this time I should make the boys take the initiative, and then things would come more naturally. Okay, I'll give it one last try. This boy I like, Nathan, is over by the pool, but he's in a group. Nothing to worry about. You'll make him come to you. Now listen and follow. I walked over to the bar and made sure I was in Nathan's eyesight. Sat as naturally as possible, 
made eye contact with him, and smiled. Oh, Martin, this is stupid. He doesn't even know me. Just wait. OMG, he's waving at me. Should I come now? No, no, no. Wave him over. Okay, you should take responsibility for this, Martin. I waved Nathan over. Then, to my surprise, he got up and started walking toward me. OMG, help, what should I do? Give a no-tooth smile. Then say, I just want to say hi. What? That was all? But he was coming closer and I had no choice. I just want to say hi. And I want to have your phone number, cutie. I couldn't believe it. That was a real success. We texted the whole night. We got on so well. He was clearly flirting with me. This is crazy. But then two weeks passed by and I didn't hear from him at all. I kept on looking at my phone, expecting Nathan to call, but he never did. So I immediately rang my coach for help. Ready for the bad news? So, that means he doesn't like you. A busy man like Napoleon could still write thousands of romantic love letters to his Josephine. If he was into you, he'd always find a way. And I also think he doesn't seem like a good type to date. What? Nathan is such a sweet guy. Maybe he's just super busy? But then Christmas came, and I couldn't wait any longer. I mustered up the courage to ask Nathan out. But guess what? He invited me to his house to enjoy Christmas with his family instead. Oh, wow. He wanted to introduce me to his family. This was massive. It meant he really took our relationship seriously, didn't he? But when we got to Nathan's place, to my surprise, it was just a small apartment and definitely not big enough for a whole family. Seeing my confused look, Nathan said his family must have changed their plans and went out, which was for the better as the two of us would have more time together. Suddenly, I saw a shadow of a girl in a red dress in his bedroom. Then Nathan immediately pulled me away and said, Uh, um, that's my maid. How annoying. So, do you want to go to the hotel so we can have more time alone? Really? Did he think I was born yesterday? I refused immediately, and Nathan began to change his attitude. Okay, but I can't drive you home. I have something urgent. But don't worry, I'll take you to the nearby bus stop. I have never felt so stupid. Martin was right. Nathan wasn't serious about me. He just wanted to use me. But what went wrong? I did everything I could, but I kept failing again and again. No one liked me. I called Martin in tears, and he ended up driving there to pick me up right on Christmas Eve. I felt like the most tragic person ever. Martin was so patient. He turned the radio on so loud and didn't say anything until I finished crying and calmed down. Misread the signals again, huh? How could I have known? Well, I'm not saying this to make money off you, but looking at the current situation, I think you need to hire me for longer than you think. My love life may have sucked, but at least I had Martin. Here's my hope. He was the best coach ever, as he didn't mind answering my questions, and he always picked up the phone whether it was office hours or midnight. Then one night I was out with my friends. I drank a few too many wines and phoned Martin up and slurred out a load of drunken nonsense. He immediately came to pick me up and drove me home, saying that he needed to make sure I got home safely. He was such a sweet guy. I felt something, but then reassured myself that he was just being nice. But Joseph insisted that Martin was only acting this way because he liked me. Seeing everything he did, and you still have to wonder about his feelings? Dummy. Believe me, I'm not wrong this time. Mr. Sixpack is crazy about you. Congrats. Hmm. Thinking about it, it did make sense. So I started stalking my coach on social media and daydreaming about him. Then, taking Martin's own advice that I needed to make my feelings known. So, on Valentine's night, I, myself, made this box of chocolates and took them round to his. I took a deep breath, then rang the doorbell. But then, standing at the door was him holding hands with another girl. I awkwardly said, Don't, don't you like me? I mean, you taught me that when a guy likes a girl... He'll always be there for her. You picked me up in the middle of the night, and you always listened and comforted me when I was sad. You even brought me hot tea when my Aunt Flo came to visit. Doesn't everything match up? R Rosie, I was just being nice. Sorry, but 
you've confused the signs again. I was totally dumbfounded. I couldn't face the thought of seeing Martin ever again, so I blocked him from my life. Ugh. In the following days, I was under a variety of emotional states, from extreme stress, heartbreak, embarrassment, then disappointment because of my extra delusion. I struggled with insomnia almost every night and tried to bury my feelings by binge-eating junk food. Just two weeks later, I looked at myself in the mirror. There were dark circles under my eyes, my skin was dry and flaky, and I felt bloated and sluggish most of the time. Seeing myself like that reminded me of something Martin had said. How can you expect someone else to love you if you don't love yourself? I knew I needed to change, so I started eating more healthily, working out, and finding me time. And you know what? It worked. Now I can finally say that I see my own worth, and I'll never allow a man to treat me badly ever again. And if that means I stay single for a while, then that's the way it'll be. I guess I kinda owe Martin a lot. I mean, he did teach me loads. And now, even though I'm still single, I'm enjoying it. There are way more important things than having a boyfriend, right? But wait, was this barista winking at me? OMG, there's a post-it with his number on my coffee cup. What should I do? Hey, dating a coffee guy is risky business. Why, coach? Imagine one day, your relationship turns bad, and you desire a cup of coffee to ease your heart out, but you also have to see him here. Awkward, huh? Indeed a pro. But, so, why are you making this awkward convo? <laughs> Rosie, I may be a love coach, but even I get it wrong sometimes. When it comes to my heart, all theories are nonsense. Please, you show me how to love naturally. Um, well, as you can see, I'm dating my dating coach. But now, our love doesn't apply to any cliches. Instead, we just do us, and we're both happier than ever. If you're in a dating slump, then don't worry. Just let love happen when it happens, and follow your heart. Let me tell you something. Something really important. I have acrophobia, so this is my idea of a nightmare. I don't want to be here at all. Oh, and that guy on the other side is Charlie, he's my boyfriend, but I don't actually like him like that. So you're probably wondering how I ended up here, 200 meters above the ground and about to make this terrifying leap? Well, let's just start from the beginning. Hi, I'm Luna, a 17-year-old high school girl from a small town in New South Wales. Growing up, I was desperate to please my hardworking single mom. The problem was she was nearly always tired and irritable. So, no matter what I said or did, it usually ended up being wrong. The most common words that came out of her mouth were, If you want me to love you, you have to be nice. I wanted her to love me more than anything else in the world, so I did everything I could to appease her. This led to the need to make everyone happy, and left me with an unfathomable fear of being hated by others. If I made other people happy, then they'd like me, right? So, whenever someone asked me to do their homework or cover for them on roll call, I did so without hesitation. And if there's ever an argument or awkward situation, regardless of if I'm to blame or not, I always apologize first. At 15, I moved to Sydney alone for high school, and that's when I met my roommate Margot. She's my complete opposite, but this didn't stop us from becoming best friends. She is independent, sassy, and doesn't let anyone pressure her into doing anything she doesn't want to. Guys, if I were more like her, I would have been able to avoid a lot of trouble. Once we had a group assignment in biology, and I, by chance, teamed up with these two popular girls. The day before the deadline, they both texted me, saying they were sick, and asked me to do their parts. This was a lot of work for one person, but I didn't want to upset them, so I agreed. But then, that night, while I was scrolling through Instagram during my brief break after hours of studying, I saw them checking in at a party. What? So they lied to me so they could go out and have fun, and left me home alone to do their homework? Oh my, I just want to take this pen and throw it right at their dumb duck faces. How was that cute in any way? Ugh, but who was I kidding? I knew full well I'd never be able to tell them what I really thought of them. So I picked up the pen and continued my workload meant for three people alone. I stayed up all night and drank three cans of energy drinks, but it was just too much work for one person to finish on time. Our assignment, or should I say, my assignment, got points deducted due to late submission, 
which somehow made the popular girls mad. What have you done? How could you turn in the assignment late? Um, I'm, I'm sorry. It's just that doing it all by myself was a bit too much for me. Oh, please. You had the whole day to finish it. It's all down to your poor time management. Right at that moment, Margot appeared out of nowhere and stepped between us. Pfft. If you both cared so much about your grades, then you would have helped Luna complete it. Instead of going to some stupid party, how about I report you to the teacher to cross out your names from Margot? Enough. Sorry, don't mind her. Then I quickly pulled Margot away. Apologizing to them was a ridiculous thing to do. It wasn't your fault. I, I know it's not my fault, but, but there's no point making a scene out of it, right? Fine. In that case, I'll leave you alone with all the troubles you've caused yourself. I don't care anymore. Oh, no, I... I didn't mean to make Margot mad. I quickly apologized to her, told her she was my best friend in the whole world, and asked her to go for a milkshake to make up. A week later, on the day my volunteer club was selling lemonade to raise funds for a children's charity, I suddenly fell sick. Oh no, I had been telling everyone at the club how important this event was, but now I was the one who'd be absent. How embarrassing! I needed to show them how sincere I was. I texted the club president that I was sick, but if the club really needed me, I could still try to participate. <sighs> Now I can finally sleep. But who would know? Before I even had time to curl up in bed, he texted back saying how they really needed my help. So if I could come, that'd be great? Oh, no. Did I really have to drag my feverish self over there? Not knowing what to do, I turned to Margot for advice. But she snapped at me. If you knew you couldn't go, why suggest otherwise? People will always take advantage of you if you let them. So just make it clear that you're sick and can't participate. Then she told me how her music club had a dinner meeting tonight. Yet she'd already decided she was having a relaxing pamper session tonight, so she immediately told them she was otherwise engaged. Ugh, Margot was right. If I'd done as she said in the first place, I wouldn't have had to rack my brains looking for excuses to say no without annoying anyone. Finally, I texted the club president that I was afraid of infecting everyone so I'd better stay home. Then I fell asleep and found my worries plaguing my dreams. The next day, I felt better. So after class, I dropped by the club's room but I instantly felt weird vibes from everyone. Then when I asked the club president how much money we'd earned from the event, he totally blanked me. Oh no, he was obviously still mad with me for letting him down. I was lost in thoughts when suddenly someone tapped me on the shoulder. I heard you were sick. Are you feeling better now? It was Charlie, one of the club members. He told me that day I was off sick. He voluntarily took over all of my work. So I invited him out for a thank you dinner right away. Hmm. Maybe he misunderstood my goodwill jester, as after that he bombarded me with texts, calls, and soppy memes. Then one day while we were walking together, Charlie suddenly stopped and took my hand. Luna, we've known each other for a while now. I think it's time for me to confess my feelings. I- I like you. Will you go out with me? Oh. My. What did he just say? I stood there dumbfounded. I mean, I liked him as a friend, but not romantically. But when I met his expectant gaze, my conscience began to torment me. He was such a nice guy, so how could I say no to him? In the end, I, I forced a smile and nodded in agreement. My feelings for him will develop over time, right? But unfortunately, the answer to this was no. <laughs> Actually, since we started dating, I found myself liking him even less than before. He does a lot of things that irritate me, such as the time he insisted we wear couple outfits to school. Yeah, slogan shirts with he's mine, she's mine printed on them should definitely be left in 2010. Ugh. He smugly ushered me around the school and seemed oblivious to the laughs and points in our direction. If only the ground could just open up and swallow me right away. That evening, noticing how fed up I looked, Marco asked me if everything was going all right between me and Charlie. So I told her everything. I thought she'd get mad at me again, but to my surprise, she just sighed and told me to tell the truth and break up with Charlie before things got too serious. That's the best way to stop both of us from getting hurt. And... Also, I've heard a lot of bad things about Charlie. People say he's kinda erratic. You better get this over with as soon as possible. Yeah, Margot's right. Next time I saw Charlie, I was ending this once and for all. Turns out I didn't have to wait long, because that Sunday afternoon, Charlie came to pick me up for our date. He told me he had a surprise in store for me, and I was gonna love it. Okay, it sounds like he'd gone to loads of effort, so it was probably best if I left breaking up with him until the journey home. Almost there! Hearing what Charlie said, I looked out the window and... Oh my god! Is that a bungee jumping spot? So, long story short, here I am. 
200 meters off the ground, my legs trembling like a leaf and my heart thudding like crazy. I was about to cry out of fear when suddenly I heard romantic music playing behind me. I turned around to see Charlie getting down on one knee. Behind him was eagle-eyed staff holding roses and candles while swaying to the music. Um, what's happening? I know we haven't been dating long, but it's clear that we're made for each other. Luna, will you marry me? What? Did I hear him wrong? I mean, I'm only 17. Seeing my puzzled look, Charlie hurriedly said, I know we're still in high school, but don't worry, we can wait till graduation. Then let's have the most wonderful wedding straight after that. This was insane. I stood there, rooted to the floor, not knowing what to do, and seeing everyone watching and waiting made me feel even more pressured. I was trying to figure all this out when Charlie forced the ring on my finger. Oh my god. What should I do? What should I do? Well, in classic me fashion, I didn't do anything. My stupid hand just froze in place, and in the end, it turned out like this. No, no, I, I couldn't let this happen. Charlie, actually, I... I, um, I don't have feelings for you. I, I was going to tell you today, but I, I didn't expect things to end up like this. You're kidding me, right? If you didn't like me, you wouldn't have let me put the ring on earlier. So I explained everything to Charlie, his face darkened with disappointment. I felt so guilty. I should have just been straight with him from the beginning, then none of this would have happened. We can still be friends, can't we? I asked, but Charlie replied without even looking at me. If you don't like me... Then why give me hope? Why the emotionless tone? It felt like he turned into a completely different person. Af afraid, I, I kept quiet, not daring to blurt out so much as a word. I'd be home soon and away from this suffocating atmosphere. But as Charlie drove, I noticed how the surroundings became stranger and stranger. This is definitely not the way to the dormitory. Finally, the car stopped at an abandoned construction site. Luna, get out of the car. Sensing his irritable tone, I did as he said. You can stay here until you've figured out that we're destined for each other. Then call me. I watched in horror as he drove away and left me there. I was all alone, in the middle of nowhere. Panicked, I called Margot for help, but as soon as she picked up, my phone ran out of power. I explored the area, but it was completely deserted. Would I be stuck here forever without anyone knowing? It was getting late. I'd barely eaten or drank anything all day, and this felt hopeless. I burst into tears, and then everything fell dark around me. I woke up to the bright lights of the hospital. Margot jumped in to give me a hug, then explained what had happened. Turns out that night after I called her, she checked my location on Snapchat and saw that I was in some deserted place. Sensing something was off, Margot and the dormitory manager went to find me and took me to the hospital. Charlie was disciplined and detained for a month for the trouble he'd caused. After that horrible experience, I talked a lot with Margot. She comforted me, encouraged me, and said that it seemed like my desire to please others stemmed from childhood trauma. Perhaps it was my mother's words. If you want me to love you, you have to be nice. That created the character I have now. I couldn't continue to let the past consume me. That summer, when I returned home to see my mom, together, we poured out our feelings and faced our problems. I finally figured out that being nice to people wasn't a bad thing, but agreeing to things just to avoid disappointing people isn't the correct thing to do at all. Now with Margot's help, I'm step by step learning to say no to things I don't want to do, cause life's way too short to say yes to everything, don't you think? Susan. Hurry up, or we'll be late to see the House of Gucci! Hang on, where was Susan? I looked around to see my friend standing on the spot. Um, Lola? Isn't that your car? I looked in the direction Susan was pointing and saw my beloved car resting on the back of a tow truck! Great! Our only mode of transport was being impounded for illegal parking! So much for a movie trip! <sighs> well, let's call it a day. My line of thought just ended when, oops, something fell on my shirt. Ah, those stupid birds! Unbelievable! This was my brand new tea, and now it was covered in bird droppings. Oh yeah, 
Welcome to a normal day in the life of Lola the Jinx. Yes, I've been called that since I was a little kid. All of my relatives, except for my parents, have always been extra wary of me. Then, when I was 12, during a boring family gathering, I overheard a heated conversation between my uncle and my parents. Stop living in denial. That girl's bad luck. Send her off to boarding school. Anywhere. As long as she's away from this family. You're being ridiculous. It's my daughter you're talking about. The fact that you lost your job has nothing to do with her. She's just a kid. That's right. This isn't Lola's fault. You need to stop blaming her for everything because of some silly words. It turned out that the silly words in question were told by a prophetess on the day of my birth. So, my family owned a famous furniture manufacturing business in the area. But unfortunately, on the day I was born, there was a fire in the workshop and they lost everything. On that same day, a prophetess passed by my house and dropped a sentence that made everyone in the family panic. That newborn is a jinx who will bring misfortune to the entire family. So that's why relatives ignore me, don't invite me to parties, and whisper about me behind my back. I don't want to believe the prophecy, but with all the bad luck I've had so far, it's hard not to. Have you ever carried an umbrella around with you for six days straight, only for it to be sunny? Then the one day you forget to bring it, it pours down? Or have you ever been able to lick a delicious looking ice cream when you tripped and splashed the whole ice cream on the poor person standing opposite you? Well, not only was I unlucky in my own right, but my ill fortune also affected the people around me. It's no wonder I'm a shy girl who struggles to make friends. Besides my parents, I only have one friend, Susan. Hey Lola, have you ever thought about breaking your bad luck? There's a very famous fortune teller in town. Breaking bad luck? Well, that sounds like a good idea. I've had enough of being Lola the Jinx. The next day, following Susan's instructions, I went to a small house on the outskirts of town. As I knocked on the door, I was nervous and excited. I hoped this would finally be the end to my run of bad luck. A woman in veil let me in. I couldn't wait any longer, so I blurted out, Hi, I'm here since I heard you could help me get rid of my bad luck, right? Please help, whatever it takes. The fortune teller sat still for a moment, then a smile lit up through her veil. You're Lola, daughter of the Gonzalez family, right? I was stunned. Whoa, she was good at her job. I mean, I hadn't even introduced myself yet. Of course, I already knew that you'd come here. But it would be difficult for me to eliminate your misfortune. There's only one person in the world who can undo your jinx. They will bear all the bad luck for you, and even bring you good luck at the same time. Is that so? But who could that be in this whole wide world? I blurted out. The fortune teller smiled and said that if I wanted further clues, that would cost me a few more bucks. Oh well, I've already come this far, so it's worth spending the rest of my monthly allowance to know who my mystery savior was right? Then she pulled out this drawstring bag and shook it. She told me to draw an item. Oh, it was a small tile with a single letter on it. A. Well, well, well. Interesting. A person whose name starts with an A. Fear not, Lola. The universe will signal you to find that very person. I then went home and couldn't stop searching my mind for people I know with A names. Um. Let's see, the most potential person was Ariel, a classmate of mine who was super lucky in everything. That's right, no one else but her. She was born wealthy and fortunate. She didn't even study and she always got good grades. Actually, she just won the school raffle. Her prize was a year's supply of donuts and a bowling trip. Obviously, she was the complete opposite of me. With her inherent luck, Surely a little bit of my jinx seasoning wouldn't make her too miserable, right? But honestly, I'm not fond of Ariel. She's sour, scornful, and a show-off. Still, dear Lola, anything was possible if you wanted to end your bad luck. So I was determined that from tomorrow, I would make her my best friend. 
together we would have the perfect balance between bad luck and good fortune. But easier said than done. Being friends with Ariel meant I had to continuously compliment her on everything. Her new shoes, high grades, choice of lipstick color. Ugh. She also made me go and queue up to get her lunch. Someone like me struggled to carry my own lunch without tripping, let alone two. But the weird thing was, I didn't fall over. Actually, ever since I started hanging out with Ariel, I couldn't recall anything bad happening. With my newfound luck, I started opening up to some of my other classmates. And you won't believe it. An unlucky girl like me even won two tickets to the opening of a new water park. So I decided to share one with Ariel. To be fair, it was her luck that got me those tickets, right? But, uh-oh. Hang on. Was that Ariel tottering out of the changing rooms in her stiletto heels? What an idiot! And right after that, just as you might have guessed, she slipped over. But to my horror, she also frantically grabbed onto my arm to take me down with her. But wait, why didn't I feel any pain? Oh, was I dreaming? Did this handsome guy just save me? As for Princess Ariel, she broke a tiny fingernail, so she just stormed off sulking. Never mind, as I had a new companion, my super cute hero, Anthony. Since then, Anthony and I talked to each other every day, and just like that, we officially became a couple. Honestly, who would have imagined that Lola the Jinx would one day have a very wonderful boyfriend like Anthony? Maybe my luck had finally changed. Yay! So the prophecy was fulfilled. Ariel was the one who brought me luck. Hmm. But actually, thinking about it, Ariel didn't seem to be having any bad luck at all in the meantime. Well, apart from the fingernail incident. But in that instance, she was lucky she didn't sprain her ankle or anything. Hmm. Perhaps we were all riding on the good luck train, for once. But there's still one thing I can't understand. Honey... Why were you so late today? Sorry, babe. On the way here, I got a flat tire. Twice! Yeah, you see, my boyfriend sure had been having a lot of bad luck lately. But wait, Anthony also has a name that began with the letter A. Could it be that it was Anthony who bore my bad luck? Not Ariel? Oh no, this couldn't be happening! Then, over the next few weeks, my suspicions were confirmed. Anthony lost his phone, he misplaced his assignment, picked up the wrong dog from the vets, and even managed to walk into his mom's brand new, expensive vase. Smash! I could continue to be a jinx, but I didn't want any of my loved ones to endure this fatigue for me. Instead, I needed to find a way to help Anthony get out of this for good. Hmm, maybe he could befriend someone super lucky. Then this would reverse his bad luck. With this plan in mind, I planned a picnic for us both, then invited the luckiest person I knew along too, Ariel. At first, it seemed to be going really well. It wasn't raining, and there weren't ants in our sandwiches. But then I noticed Ariel giggle and twizzle with her hair as she looked at... Anthony! Oh no, Ariel had a crush on my boyfriend! The problem was, the more I saw them together, happy and bad luck free the more I concluded that Anthony was better off without me. <sighs> so I started ignoring his calls and messages and purposely avoided the places I knew he would be. All was going well, until he showed up outside my school. Ugh! Lola, why are you ignoring me? What did I do wrong? I pretended not to hear anything and kept walking, but he ran after and caught me by my wrist. So I yelled at him. Nothing! You're perfect! That's why I stopped talking to you. I'm a jinx, and you deserve better. He gave me a confused look. So I explained all about how bad luck had a way of following me and the people I was closest to. And that's why I had set up a date for him and Ariel. You're such a fool. Are you seriously ready to throw away what we have because of some stupid prophecy? Plus, I'm not an object for you to just give away to whoever you want. Then he stormed off. This was awful. 
Now I'd gone and lost my amazing, sweet, caring boyfriend, and I only had myself to blame. Later that night, Mom walked into the living room and saw me slumped on the couch, crying. She asked me what was wrong, and I blubbered out all about my bad luck, the fortune teller, and how I lost my boyfriend because of it. I think it's time I visited this fortune teller. It might be the prophetess from the day you were born. I didn't see her back then as I was in the hospital with you. If it really is her, I'm longing to know why she decided to put so much stress on our family with her ludicrous words. The next day, Mom and I went to the fortune teller's place. Mom yanked the veil off her face and stared at her in shock. Turns out they went to school together. And back then, this woman was jealous of my mom's luck. A jealousy she never got past. So she tried to sabotage her by telling those ridiculous prophecies to not only me, but the rest of our family. Thinking about it, throughout my childhood, my relatives treated me like a bad luck charm. So that's how I acted. I alienated myself, acted insecure, and had no confidence. Maybe it was my negative energy that was making me unlucky. Not some dumb prophecy. So what happened next? Well, Mum made sure the whole town found out about what a fraud the fortune teller is. She wrote a public apology to us and paid us compensation. As for me, I decided it was time to make my own luck. So I went round to Anthony's and handed him two tickets for the water park. And I apologized for all my superstitious nonsense. He seemed to appreciate the gesture. And he forgave me. So we're back together. Yay! From now on, it's only positive vibes, happy thoughts, and grasping life's opportunities. The most important thing I've learned is that if you see life as beautiful, it'll always be beautiful to you in return. I'm Meg, and I'm just your standard 21-year-old college girl. Well, at least I thought I was. My story begins normally enough. I have this huge crush on a guy who was in his senior year. He's called Ian, and he's funny, sweet, and extremely attractive. I've noticed him since my first year here, but it's only recently that I think he's started to notice me, too. College life meant that our paths crossed in the campus, coffee house, the corridors, the library, and at house parties, so he did know my name at least. So it's not the kind of pathetic crush when they don't even know that you exist. Now, whenever he sees me in these places, we smile and say hey to each other, and his eyes always linger on me that split second longer. I really figured that his lingering looks meant he had a crush on me too, and I had a chance with him. I'd been in the cheer team back in high school, but initially, I was unsure about joining the team at college, as my workload's so intense. But Ian's a massive sports fanatic, and he's on the football team, so... I joined the cheerleading team to have an excuse to be close to him, as the cheer practice had the same schedule as the football team. My plan worked, and we started talking more. So, okay, it was only small talk. Stuff like, hey, how was practice? And it's the perfect weather for practice, isn't it? Well, they might not have won conversation of the year, but it was a start. Besides, sweaty end-of-practice chats didn't put me at my flirting prime as it's hard to maintain cuteness when my hair was stuck to my forehead. Talking to him gave me a buzz and meant that I couldn't sleep that night. To celebrate their awesome season ranking, the football team planned a party. Of course, they'd invited the cheerleaders, but as a newbie, I was nervous about going along, as I didn't know anyone all that well. After the practice, I was walking home when a familiar voice shouted, Wait up! behind me. I spun around to see that it was Ian. As delighted as I was, I couldn't shake off the feeling that I was being watched. I looked over to the right a bit and saw a woman in a black luxury car was staring at me. But as soon as I spotted her, she closed the car window and looked away. That was a bit strange, but I couldn't care less about it, as my crush was standing right in front of me. You're coming to the party, right? Bring your friends over too. The more the merrier. Ian smiled at me. I stood there in a daze, but I managed to nod and said, Yeah, sure. He quickly walked away, but didn't forget to turn back to tell me, See you tonight. I got jelly legs and had to lean on the closest wall to me to balance myself. Was this real? I pinched myself, and it was totally real. 
Ian technically just asked me out, right? Then I noticed something. Ian got into the passenger side of the black car with the strange staring woman. This was odd. I mean, who was she? Maybe she was his aunt or something, and she'd only been staring weirdly at me as he'd told her all about me? Excitement overruled my uneasy feeling. I rushed home so I could plan out my outfit. On my way back, I called up my best friend Liv. Ian told me to bring a friend, and who else would I bring? Liv is my best friend. We're inseparable. She often sits out in the field waiting for me to finish my cheerleading practice, and smiles over at me when she sees Ian chatting to me. I told Liv to come pick me up. I didn't want to drive because I think I'll be leaving with Ian later anyway, and if that's the case, Liv could drive home herself. We got to the house party. Everyone was having fun. Liv quickly blended in on the dance floor. I tried to enjoy it too, but couldn't help but look around, searching for Ian, the only reason why I was there. As I was lurking, I also met eyes with a very cute guy. He kept on looking at me. As cute as he was, my sights were firming set on Ian. After what seemed like ten laps of the cramped house, I finally found Ian. He's walking in with a red solo cup in hand, casually fist-bumping everyone. It's like there's a halo around him. He's so hot! He walked towards me and was really friendly. Then, Liv appeared by my side and gave me a hug. Ian asked Liv lots of questions, which I thought was sweet. He was making an effort with my friend, which made him so thoughtful and polite. Now that I knew Ian was around, I could finally relax and enjoy the party a bit. Then, I went to the backyard to get some beer for me and Liv. I came back inside carrying the beers. Liv had moved, so I went in search of her. That's when I found her kissing someone by the staircase. Firstly, I felt excited for her. My bestie was kissing a cute boy. But then I realized that the boy she was kissing had the same light wash denim jeans on as Ian. And the same perfectly styled hair. Wait a minute. It was Ian! My best friend in the whole world was kissing the boy I liked. I was so upset I dropped the beers, then ran outside in tears. I sat on the curb feeling devastated. How could Liv do this to me? I looked up through teary eyes and noticed that further up the road, there was a luxury black vehicle parked up. That was weird. Was it the same vehicle as before? I went to the football team party certain that I was finally going to hook up with my crush Ian. Only, I found Ian kissing my best friend Liv. Now, I was sitting outside on the curb feeling dreadful. Jeez, this night sucked. I stared at the black vehicle. Why was it following me? Maybe I should go and check it out. Suddenly, a hand tapped my shoulder. Startled, I turned around and saw that it was Ian. Thank you so much, Meg, for setting me up with Liv. Don't worry, I'll definitely pay you back. How about lunch on Sunday? My treat. He winked, then walked off. I sat there, open-mouthed. Was he serious? He hadn't even noticed that I was crying. What a jerk. I felt like I was about to blow. My sobbing increased. I felt so rejected. So does that mean he didn't like me, but he liked Liv? Had he ever liked me? What was wrong with me? Worse still, Liv knows I have a massive crush on him, but she still kissed him? I felt so betrayed. I'd lost both my crush and best friend in the same night. This party was terrible. Suddenly, I remembered the black vehicle, so I looked over to where it was. Only, it wasn't there anymore. I shrugged. I had bigger things to deal with right now than some weirdo in a posh car. The tears wouldn't stop. I was basically a waterfall. I wiped them onto the back of my arm, but this didn't help much. Someone sat down next to me. A guy. Hey, what's wrong? He asked. Through blurry eyes, I realized that it was the cute guy who'd been eyeing me up earlier at the party. I was too upset to reply to him, so I just sat there crying and shivering, which wasn't a good look. He took his jacket off and placed it around my shoulders. I can't have you freezing to death on my conscience. He smiled. His smile was infectious, and even through my tears, I found myself smiling too. Whatever it is, you shouldn't let it ruin your night. You're here now, so you should have a good time. This guy was right. Liv and Ian were certainly having a great time, so why should I be the one sat here miserable? 
I didn't need Ian or Liv, so they were both welcome to each other. I was at this lame party now, and I didn't have my car with me, so I was stuck here. I may as well make the most of it. Let's get a drink, I blubbered out. I wiped my tears, and the guy helped me up, and we went inside. Jackpot for me, he's very cute. His name's Nick, and he's friends with one of the guys on the football team. I spent the rest of the party with Nick. We danced around and played party games. Turns out I sucked at beer pong, so I ended up quite tipsy from all the beer I had to down. I felt tired and wanted to go home, but how on earth could I sit in the same car as that traitor live? Talk about the most awkward car journey home ever. I couldn't put myself through it. Then Nick offered me a ride home. I acted shy, but agreed. I mean, who could say no to him? Besides, he'd cheered me up tonight. I told him the address and dozed off a bit in the back seat, then woke up just in time to tell him to turn left at the next intersection. Then it'd be my house. But to my horror, he sped up and drove past it. Confused, I told him that we needed to make a U-turn, but he just ignored me and smirked. I panicked. Then I yelled at him, What are you doing? Suddenly, he answered the phone. I heard a female voice on the other end. I stayed quiet to listen, but couldn't tell what she was saying. He replied, Yes, I've got her here. We're on the way. Was I really being kidnapped? I needed to find a way to get out. I thought about calling my sister to help pick me up, and I'd jump out of the car at a red stop. I called her and whispered to her the situation and to come find me at the gas station we're about to pass by. I didn't hang up just yet. I told Nick, I've already told my sister, if you don't release me now, she'll call the police. He looked taken aback. My plan did work a little, but not enough to make him stop the car. I had to switch to plan B, jumping out of the car. From now till we get to the gas station, there would be three red stops, and I'd have to brace myself to jump, or else we'd get to the highway and there would be no turning back. First, it was a green light. Second one, I had my hands on the car door handle, but was too scared to open it. Third one, I had to do this now or never. As we approached the lights, I closed my eyes and was about to do it. Then he suddenly turned left. I panicked. He stopped the car and told me to get out. Confused, I froze. Then his phone rang again. I saw the pic of the caller. It's a woman. Seems a little familiar. As the phone rang, he yelled at me to get out again. I quickly opened the door and fell to the ground. He drove away immediately. I sobbed out to my sister on the phone, and through my fear, I tried explaining what had just happened. With my shaking hands, I managed to share my location with her. Then I walked to try and find some place with bright lights to wait for her. I was in total panic mode until I got home. As I calmed down a bit, I started to put things together and wondered why he did this to me. And then, it came to my mind that the caller was the woman in the black luxury car I saw that afternoon. Then, this means it all had something to do with Ian. Is it because she thought I was Ian's girlfriend or something? But when she found out I wasn't, she ordered my release? If Ian has something to do with this, then that means Liv could now be in danger. Should I warn her, or is it now that traitor's problem, not mine? I'm mad with her, but I don't want anything bad to happen to her. I don't know what this is all about. What should I do now? This is the story of how I broke the heart of a girl who really loved me, and I'm not proud of what I'm about to tell you, but here goes. It all started in freshman year of high school. I was living on Mayotte Island, which is a super beautiful French island. And unlike all the stylish guys at my school, I was pretty lame in comparison. Not only was I overweight, as in 95 kilograms, I was also one of the dumbest kids in class. Basically, I was a bit of a loser. And because of this, no one really wanted to be my friend. I was always eating lunch alone, and not one kid would sit at my table. This went on for a whole year. And by the time summer break came, I decided I couldn't take it anymore. Something had to change. So while everyone at school was vacationing and partying and enjoying the summer, I was working on something else. I set a goal for myself to lose weight before we went back to school, and I was really determined. I did a lot of research to figure out the best way, 
watching lots of YouTube videos and reading articles on Google about losing weight. And believe it or not, I stumbled across a really simple way. All I had to do was drink a lot of water and eat less, and I'd easily lose weight. At least that's what the article said. So I gave it a go. And I'm not going to lie, it was tough. Some days I'd have killed for a soda, and there were moments where I gave in to my cravings and binged on a liter of ice cream. But then I'd think about the fact I had no friends and how lonely life was, and my motivation would come back. By the end of summer break, I'd done it. I couldn't believe it. I'd lost 26 kilograms in total. So I was down to 69 kilograms, and for a 1.85 meter tall guy, that is very slim. That first day back at school, all eyes were on me. Every single girl suddenly noticed me, and some of them even tried to speak to me. One girl asked if I was a new kid, and I almost laughed. Did I look that different? Even though girls were suddenly interested in me, I wasn't interested in them at all. That wasn't my goal. My goal was to get friends, and it happened very quickly. Pretty soon, I had a big group of friends, and because I felt more confident, my grades also started to get better. All of a sudden, I understood what socializing felt like, and I got invited to parties for the first time in my life. At one of these parties, me and my new group of friends were joking around and decided to make a bet to see who could get Najma, the prettiest girl in school, to go out with them. Najma is very petite, but she has such a beautiful body. And don't get me started on her face. Her eyes are this deep chestnut color, and her skin is so clear. Plus, she has these really cute cheeks that always blush pink when she smiles. Honestly, she's gorgeous, and every single guy in our school was crazy about her. But even after lots of attempts, none of them had managed to get her attention. Now that I was feeling good about myself and looking pretty decent, I decided to give it a go. I wanted to win her over. One day, I approached her at the bus stop. She was standing there on her own, and I just casually walked over to her and started making conversation. We got on the bus, and we chatted the whole way until the bus reached her stop. Just before she got off, I asked for her number, and to my complete surprise, she actually gave it to me. Jackpot! On the one hand, I was super happy that my first attempt to ever flirt with a girl had ended so successfully. But on the other hand, I knew I was about to do the worst thing ever. Play with a girl's heart just to win a stupid bet. I really regret what I did back then, but I had no other choice. I was scared that if I failed at this one thing, my friends would ditch me, and I'd be a loser again. There was no turning back now, and no room for failure either. I would succeed at this, just like I'd succeeded at losing weight. I gave her a call and we chatted for like three hours. It was amazing. After that, we spoke every night on the phone and became really close. Two weeks later, we were an item. And it was official. I had a girlfriend. On our first date, we met at the mall. It was a nice place close to the beach. And after getting some pizza, we headed down there for a walk. And we kissed. My first kiss ever. I will never forget that moment for as long as I live. It's one of the best memories we shared together. And it'll be carved in my heart forever. That's how special it was. Everything was going well, but after a few months of being a couple, I slowly started to drift away from her. I don't know what got into me. I just started ignoring her calls, and even ignored her at school, too. She tried to sit with me at lunch, but I always said there was no space, but that I'd call her later. I was seriously being mean to her. Well, eventually, she started to think something was wrong, and at first, she suspected I was dating someone else behind her back. But later the real truth came out. She found out that I was only dating her because of a bet. Some guy in my class called Lara told her. That was such a bummer, but I wasn't too surprised since Lara was my worst enemy. He's been constantly making my life a living hell, and guess he couldn't just let me catch a break. Of course, she broke up with me. A few days after she found out the truth, she called me to end things. As soon as we hung up, I felt so bad and realized that I really did have proper feelings for her. At first, it had just been about the bet and impressing my friends, but there was no denying that I legit liked this girl. I missed her so much, and it quickly became obvious that she was missing me too, because one night, I received a message from her on Facebook that she must have sent to me by accident. It said, Oh, I just miss him so much. Even though he hurt me, I know he's a good guy. I don't think I'll ever be able to get over him. 
I caught a glimpse of it on the notification, but when I opened it, the text was removed. She must have meant to send it to her friend, which is a bit awkward. So I acted like I didn't see it, but now, at least I found out she still had feelings for me. By then, though, it was too late. I'd moved to mainland France for university, but I missed her so much. It's been 10 months since then, and I still have feelings for her. We got back in contact and chat three times a week, even though she's still on Mayotte Island and I'm in France. But she thinks it's better if we just stay friends now, as she's not ready to be in a relationship with me again. She's just graduated from high school, and I really don't know what to do. I just want to be with her again. But do you think I've ruined my chances forever? Hi, that's me, Maxine, hiding behind some bushes and spying on a girl. Don't get me wrong, I don't have a crush on her, nor am I a total psychopath. I'm just doing a favor for my mate Damon. But if I'd known how crazy this was all going to get, I'd never have agreed to help him. It all started when Damon fell in love with this girl, Sophie. She had this mysterious charm that made him want to talk to her right away. And he did. She didn't even glance at him. She just walked away. Ouch. I didn't like her one bit. She was so stuck up. But Damon didn't give up that easily. He tried all kinds of tricks to get her attention, even waiting for the bus with her, even though he had a car. Nothing worked, though, and this made him miserable. He begged for my help, but I said, No way! Then he said, Aw, oh, come on, Maxine, you're a girl, so just befriend her or something. Maybe you can find out what she likes, her fave foods, music, etc. Then I can try to impress her. Please, I'm begging you. I'll even lend you my Nintendo Switch for a month if you agree. You can't say no to that. He had me at that. I'd do anything to get a Nintendo Switch. Fine, it's a deal. But don't blame me if it doesn't work. So, after class that day, I searched for Sophie. She was at the bus stop, and I was about to approach her when suddenly she walked away. I decided to follow her, and on the way, she stopped to help an old lady cross the road. Wow, I was surprised. For someone with such a cold face, she had a pretty warm heart. Hmm, maybe she wasn't so bad after all. After that, she started walking towards the park, and by then it was starting to get dark. What was she doing? She sat down on a bench in a creepy part of the park, almost like she was waiting for someone. I hid behind a bush so she wouldn't see me, but I was totally freaked out. Suddenly, two guys appeared and started talking to her, but they didn't seem like her acquaintances. Oh my gosh, she looked panicked. I had to help. I quickly shouted, Help! Officer! Please help! There are two guys bothering us! Obviously, there was no officer, but it worked. The two guys ran off, and I rushed over to make sure Sophie was okay. She was surprised to see me, but then she hugged me and thanked me for saving her. Her whole body was shaking. She must have been terrified. I walked with her back to our dorm, and she told me how she liked to come to the park at night because it was so peaceful. I told her it was clearly dangerous and that she probably shouldn't go alone anymore. Then we exchanged numbers, and after that we became quite close. Close enough. That was a few days later I told her Damon had a big crush on her, and asked if she'd maybe go on a date with him. But she just shook her head and said she wasn't ready. Her eyes looked sad, so I didn't push it any further. Maybe she'd just gone through a bad breakup? I didn't ask her again, but one night I was heading to her dorm for a movie night when I heard two people fighting. It was Sophie and some guy, and she was crying. It looked like the guy was about to hit her, so I ran over and said, Hey, what the heck do you think you're doing? Leave her alone or I'll call the cops. He just laughed at me and said to Sophie, We are not done yet. Then he stormed off. I asked Sophie if she was okay and who that guy was. Then she told me how he was her ex and that he kept trying to get back together with her, but she wasn't interested. As she told me this, she started to cry and said, Because of him, I've become so scared and anxious. I'm even too scared to sleep at night. I felt so sorry for her and told her I was here for her and that she could call me any time. Well, maybe I shouldn't have said that, because that's exactly what she started doing. Every night she'd call me 
and we'd end up chatting until 3 a.m. I was so exhausted, but I wanted to help her. She seemed so anxious all the time. Damon knew we chatted a lot, but he'd stopped asking about Sophie. It seems he'd lost interest and was more worried about me looking like a zombie from The Walking Dead. You seriously need some sleep, Maxine. Leave Sophie be. She's clearly got issues. It's probably best to not get too involved. Easier said than done, though. But that night, I decided not to answer her call. I went to bed early, and when I woke up the next morning, I had about 20 missed calls and 50 texts from her. Oh my gosh! Some of them said she was so lonely and that I'd abandoned her. Then one said, if you don't pick up, then I will end it all. Okay, this was crazy. I immediately called her, but she wouldn't pick up. I rushed to her dorm, but nobody answered. I was panicking by then and bashing on the door, screaming, Sophie, open this darn door! But there was still no answer. I was terrified she'd done something bad, so I asked some students to help me bash down the door, and that's when she opened the door. I've never been so happy to see someone alive. I ran over to hug her, but she looked so annoyed. What are you doing here? You're making a scene, she said. What? I was so worried about you. You said you were going to... But she interrupted me and said, You need to get some sleep, Maxine. You seem insane. I couldn't believe it. After all those calls and texts, she was the insane one, not me. I didn't feel like yelling back, so I just left her. I needed some space. She tried to apologize to me over the next few days, but I didn't want to be around her. She even texted me saying if I wouldn't be her friend anymore, then life wasn't worth living. I was so tired of her threats, so I just ignored them. And then things got worse. A few days later, Damon and I were studying together when Sophie called me and said she was in the hospital. She told me that she had a brain tumor and they'd just done a biopsy to see if it was malignant or benign. I couldn't believe it. She asked me if I could pick her up and I said, of course, this was so scary. I told Damon and he just said, I think she's making it up, Maxine. How could she suddenly have a tumor? You guys just had a fight and suddenly she's in the hospital? Come on, think about it. I was shocked. Damon, how could you? You're such a jerk. Then I ran off and arrived at the hospital to find Sophie sitting outside wearing a hospital cap. She said her hair had been shaved off for the biopsy, and I asked to see the scar, but she wouldn't show me. She said she'd get a headache if she took it off. I was just glad that she was okay and gave her a ride home. We made up, and I decided to look after her for the day. She seemed so weak, I couldn't bear to see her suffering. I called Damon to tell him that he owed me an apology and told him about Sophie. And he just said, Oh, wow, okay, sorry, hope she's okay then. But then a few days later, he called me and said, Listen, Maxine, Sophie's a liar. She didn't have a biopsy. I bumped into her earlier and her cap fell off, and she has a full head of hair under there. No way it would grow back that fast. Why would she lie to me? I didn't get it. I needed to know the truth, so after class, I went to her dorm. She opened the door right away, and sure enough, she had all her hair intact. She probably knew Damon had told me, and so hadn't even bothered to keep up the lie. This made me furious. Straight away, I started shouting at her. Honestly, Sophie, what is wrong with you? Why would you pretend to be sick like that? Friends don't do that. Sophie grabbed my hand and said, Maxine, I'm sorry. I was desperate. I only did it because I missed you and wanted you to care about me again. I took it too far, though. Please forgive me. Are you crazy? I screamed. I was worried sick about you. Are you sure there's not something wrong with you? Sophie started grinning in a weird way and said, The only thing wrong with me is that I'm in love with you, Maxine. She wouldn't let go of my hand, and I just stared in shock. Wh what, what did you say? You heard me. I love you. Then she started to manically laugh and said, I've loved you since the day we first met. I knew you were following me, so I pretended to be in danger so you'd come rescue me. Even my ex-boyfriend was fake. He was just one of my friends pretending. Can't you see? I'm willing to do just about anything to get your attention. If that's not love, then what is? 
This couldn't be happening. I tried to stay as calm as possible and said, Listen, Sophie, I'm flattered. Really, I am. But I'm straight. I see you as just a friend, okay? But Sophie wouldn't give up. She grabbed my hands again and said, How do you know that? You didn't even try to love me yet. Just give me a chance and I'll show you what true love looks like. I tried to let go of her hands, but it was impossible. Sophie grabbed my hands tighter and tighter that it even began to hurt. She looked me in the eyes and, oh my god, it's like I couldn't recognize her anymore. She looked like a crazy person, like a psychopath. Then she began to speak in a really creepy tone. You can't get away from me. You're mine now. I was so scared. I needed to get out of here, so I pushed her really hard that she fell on the ground and I ran like a mad woman out of there until I was back in my dorm. Then I called the police, but by the time they reached her dorm, she was gone. I told them what happened and showed them a photo of her, and you won't believe it. Apparently, I wasn't the only girl Sophie had attacked. There were other girls, too. After that night, I was terrified. Everywhere I went, it felt like someone was watching me. Then one evening, after my shift at work, I was walking through the park back to my dorm, when I heard someone up ahead. I knew right away it was Sophie, but she wasn't alone. She was with some guys. They spotted me and started heading towards me. But I ran as fast as I could, and luckily the police were just outside the park and went in and arrested them. Sounds like a coincidence, right? Well, it wasn't. Sophie's not the only one who can fool people. I knew Sophie was stalking me, so I told the police, and together we created this plan to catch her, and voila, it worked. Sophie, if you're watching this, I wish you all the best, but let's not meet ever again. That's enough stalking for one lifetime.